We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, Tom, did you know that there was a Canadian federal election that just took place? I heard that uh, your <laughs> prime minister is still your prime minister. Our that's, prime that's minister heard, but... is still our prime minister. I uh, Honestly, the results are not all in. We're recording this on a Tuesday. Uh, the election took place on Monday. And uh, yeah, but there were so many mail-in ballots that that is not completely finalized. And some certain races are very, very close but it appears as though uh yeah the liberal party picked up one seat uh not Ooh, the that was worth it not the 14 seats they would have needed to uh, create a majority government so we are continuing on with a minority government almost exactly the same as it was prior to the election so that was worth uh doing and uh, and for all of us of, all of those in the, in the states who are listening to this and going what is he talking about don't worry about it. we don't care <laughs> yeah, when we you guys care. have a federal election, the whole world has to know about it because you also ah, yeah. campaign for what three and a half years prior to it. Uh, yeah, I don't think they ever stopped campaigning. DeSantis <laughs> has much. been campaigning for since since January. <laughs> so yeah, that's we don't uh, we don't not camp- campaign around here. So for I really people... wish they would do something about that. I'll be honest with you, it's miserable. The TV. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have cable TV anymore for right. that exact reason. It just, it just it's just nonstop political ads just nonstop and it's you know smear campaigns and everything else i just ugh, can't be yep. bothered I don't for the for the folks it. outside of canada who have just just started to remember that our prime minister is named justin trudeau you don't have to change anything that is still the case and you can continue Good. on your yeah. merry way just as we shall since we changed virtually nothing about the makeup of our federal government so there we go that was that was fun that's to right. watch that's right <laughs> i am gonna have some news coming up pretty soon okay that's what I'm going to say. And it's uh, about books. Oh, okay. A book. Gotcha. So there will be some book news in the coming week or okay. weeks. Okay, not this episode. Week. It's not that kind of tease. It's a tease. No, for... it's not this. It's not this. Ep- I don't think it's Further into I the might. future. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows it's what coming. we'll do. I'm waiting on one thing. I'm waiting on one thing. And then we'll okay. catch something coming. So those well, of you that are tired of he- hearing my intro, there's going to be a new one. Yeah. Very soon. So for nothing else, I'm going to try to make it like not 30 seconds or not however many seconds it is that you guys can easily skip. I'll have to recalibrate how I offset the timestamps that I put in there, but that's all right. We'll figure it out once I hear it. Yeah. So we're not a political podcast. We're not a book podcast. We are a home theater and AV podcast. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think I'm going to talk about AV this week. Let's talk about (laughs) us. Let's just talk. Let's just talk. Uh, I don't even know what we what would we talk about. What do we have in common that's not AV? Me and you, you and I, you and me. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> Pronouns. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. I, gotta, I, mean, I always have to think about it. Should be you I and I. That. I would think. What What do I have in common with you? So yeah, it would be I. There we go. Yes. Got to work it out. You oh, your camera's common. frozen. It's gonna switch. Oh, it didn't no, switch. It just froze. It, it didn't switch. It just froze. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Oh, enough dilly dally. We got, we got questions. All right. This is AV Rant. Over. Yeah, that's right. The podcast that answers your home theater and AV <laughs> questions when Rob's not talking about politics that's constantly. Right. Mm-hmm. Just forever. To get your question answered, all you have to do is ask you. Ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to avrant.com. Leave us a comment. Facebook.com slash podcast. YouTube.com slash avrant. You can contact us directly. There it goes. Hey, Mike. Ah, there we go. That's I, I got to see what it looks like. Make sure that I'm I'm framed okay. You are My definitely not. Oh, you I have am definitely not. No hairline this, at present. You look the, hey, like you're bolder that's true, than I am. true. No matter if week. I, my, well, however my camera is, is pointed. <laughs> I have a hairline. It's, okay. It's up there. It's been up there for a long time. It's not going anywhere. It doesn't seem like. I'm kind of disappointed, actually, because I, once I get like a, a, a bald spot in the back, I plan on mm. just getting rid of it. Right. Let's unplug this other camera. Let's yeah, I here. think that's the safer thing to do. It messes yeah. up our audio by like one and a half seconds by the end of it. Yeah, yeah. I gotta move it though. So hold on a second. I gotta okay. Move it over here. Because if I don't move it, then I'll look at it. I so will I gotta, say I, I did. Gotta, I gotta look at it. I'm I so a, used to looking at it. I like, I'm looking at it right now as I'm talking to you. <laughs> I did a 23 and Me thing, and I was very happy to see that genetically I am unlikely to develop a bald spot. I was very happy about that. 
What? I don't want to get a bald spot. <laughs> you already shave your head. Who cares? I, I, that's what my mom said. She's like, why do you care? You already shave your head. I'm like, I was preparing just in case I was already ready. But maybe maybe now I don't have to. Well, my dad's got one. My brother's got right. one. My other brother probably has one. I don't know. I haven't seen him in like a decade. So, you know. I'm waiting for it. I keep my now. My youngest son will walk past me constantly. Twelve years old, walk past me constantly. Go, Dad, you're wow. You're really getting. A, you're really losing your hair. I'm mm, like, mm, mm, you say that with my food in your mouth. You might want to reconsider <laughs> your position on my hair before you start talking smack, there, boy. But uh, you know, I, I've asked my people who cut my hair, and uh, I've asked my wife. I'm like, if it's bald back there, I want to know because it's mm-hmm. going off, man. I'm going straight. I'm going. I'm shaving it. That's fa- if I could start doing my shaving my head at home and not having to go someplace to have it done, it, it would be a lot more consistent. Uh, contact Rob directly, Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at fish. First reflect Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. I want to thank our listeners of the week. Mm-hmm. Be a listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. If you want to support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash avrent podcast where you can become one of our 133 patrons. That give us, uh, that give uh, their contributing supporter every month. A little bit of money comes from them and goes to Patreon. They take a cut, smallish cut. I don't really actually know how much cut that is. And they send most of it to us. So uh, thank you to our 133 patrons over at patreon.com. For sure. That is patreon.com slash AVRant podcast. If you'd like to sign up, see that number tick upward in the subscriber column there. So 133 patrons, big thank you to all of you for the financial support. So I also want to mention that uh, this is not really a patron thing, but you know, whatever. Uh, Andrew, if you go over to mm-hmm. uh, avgadgets.com, you'll yes. see we have a new writer over there. Andrew yeah. Thomas has been writing for me. He's uh, He discovered us through the podcast. He's been a, a listener for a lot of years, reached out, said, uh, Dom, you would want me to write for you? I was like, I don't know. Can you write? And he said, well, this is what I've written before. I was like, no, nah, you can write, I guess. And uh <laughs> Uh, then he sent me some stuff. I was like, all right, it's good. So we started uh, putting it up there. He just published this week a Paradigm review. Yeah. A Paradigm premiere series review of the his speakers that he bought. So, you know, not the least biased review we're probably ever going to do. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but he was up front about it. So I don't really care. And, the, you know, I mean, I thought he was he gave them a pretty fair shake. Uh, and then some other stuff he's been writing for, for us, too. So uh, Great. T- check, check him out over there, Andrew Thomas. So thank you, Andrew, for becoming part of the AV Gadgets team. All right. Uh, that is currently just me and you. So it's more of a duo than a team. But we're getting there. Can I just, we're like a pool team, like, you know, yeah. billiards, not yep. a soccer team. Well, I will say congratulations to Andrew. I know from Twitter that he is excited about it and enjoying writing for avgadgets.com. So that is great. I hope that continues, and I hope it continues to go well. Yes. So we've got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during during the ongoing pandemic. I don't know if I can still say ever worsening anymore because I feel like the numbers, at least around here, are coming down. Okay. Uh, Though that just may be they just don't have any more beds so they can't go up anymore. there's that i'm not really sure in what's terms going of on hospitalizations anyway very tr- very much trying not to, to, to not to focus on it because it's depressing but mm-hmm. we've got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from jonathan the c uh jonathan his uh i guess it's now the 4.0 rebuild is underway mm-hmm. so that's exciting for him tom uh not me a different tom garinder who says uh when we were joking about having to cover everything including yourself in black velvet in order to get the very best projector contrast and black levels we missed his favorite the black contact lenses that's right that's right <laughs> i actually the demon eyes would, i would buy those mm. i if would you could see through them it's, i mean if, if it was a through them i don't yeah because i would buy them if at all possible you know, anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl, who appreciated uh, Rob and DJ joining Carl's email thread to discuss IMAX a- aspect ratios. Max, who says he appreciates all the advice and entertainment we provide. Mike, DJ, Dave, Michael, and Jack. So we've got Jonathan, Tom, Garinder, Carl, Max, Mike, DJ, Dave, Michael, and Jack. So thank you for thanking us. There we go. I'll say the names one more time so it comes out of my mouth. Jonathan, Tom, Garinder, Carl, Max, Mike, DJ, Dave, Michael, and Jack. Thank you all very much for sending those notes of gratitude and encouragement. Really do appreciate it. Big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. 
And just before we hop into the news, I'll just mention that uh, DJ on his Bright Side Home Theater podcast, uh, right. this just this last week did an interview with a representative from Kaleidoscape named Brett. Uh, had a really good conversation over there. They went for two hours because it's DJ Ooh, and the man can yeah. talk. Uh, but no, it was uh, good information there. Um, a little bit promotional, as one might expect. Uh, but uh, yeah, they had some some good notes on some of the lesser uh, discussed parts of Call Out Escape that uh, appealed yeah. to home theater nuts and that particularly like uh, uh, sending out triggers for like if you have four-way motorized masking to make sure your masking matches exactly to the particular movie you're watching, not just presets for like set aspect ratios, but exactly to what the uh, that particular movie is, you know, 2.39 versus... Does it change versus... in the midst of a movie like with I, Dark Knight? Yeah, yeah, I don't know about that. That would have been a question I would have asked yeah. DJ. Yeah, that That's fun. what a professional does, DJ. <laughs> if you I didn't was, do that, DJ, then what are you even doing? I was surprised at DJ's surprise that so much of Kaleidoscape's business is on uh, yachts because... That, I am not surprised about that. I'm not surprised about that whatsoever. <laughs> that In uh, in Vancouver, where I live, uh, or close to Vancouver anyway, uh, the biggest part of the home theater industry is boats and yachts. They, they do That's... more of that here than they do houses, so... That's nuts. I will tell you though. I think it's cheaper to live on a. I think it's cheaper to buy a yacht, live in a dock around <laughs> right. here than it is to actually live in a house. They're both very and expensive safer. here. I mean, I don't really know what you do during a hurricane. I don't know if mm. I, I keep. I'm used to stepping on the 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 platform that I, and it's going to rock this the camera. So oh, okay. I'm, I apologize to you guys. I'm just used to stepping on it, and it's cool, and it cools my foot off because it's metal. So I'm sorry, guys. I saw. I apologize. We're, it, it's not. It's not a video podcast. Who who is it even isn't. on YouTube? Mike, what are you doing? Come There's on. about 800, 900 people who watch us there. Hey, what's up, yeah. guys? <laughs> I assume you're all named Mike. <laughs> I assume some of them are duplicates just watching on different computers. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you even do that? All right. Uh, in the news, SVS's, SVS, their prices are increasing. And uh, we, I think we talked about this last week. Did we talk about this last week? You mentioned, mentioned it, it but we passing. didn't have details. So now we got some details. Yeah. So the, they're going up pretty much across the board, and it's starting uh, the day before my birthday, October okay. 4th. In case anybody's wondering, cycling stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what I want. <laughs> so we won't go through literally every price change, but there's a few examples. Basically, the just it's about 100 bucks. I mean, 50 Large to $100, zone, dollars, depending on yeah. Yeah. So the SB2 1000 Pro finishes. Finishes. Well, so, yeah, because there's whatever. the basic black oak and then the gloss black and the gloss white. Yeah. So they're all going up 100 bucks. Yeah. Uh, so there's not going to be any more uh, $500 subs from SVS, but yeah. that's not really SVS, SVS's fault. I mean, I mean, this is this is all a supply chain issue, and this is you gotta expect this across the board, not just with AV, materials, but like everything. supply chain, shipping. Everything. You put it all yeah. together because, of course, the shipping yeah. charge is included with SVS. So you put it all together, yeah. going up hundred bucks. So the cheapest sub that SVS sells now is the black ash finish of the SB One Thousand Pro, which will now be six hundred dollars. That is the cheapest subwoofer. Well, I was SVS. talking about shipping. I was actually talking about shipping them. You know the materials and stuff from that like too. China all aspects stuff. of the all shipping. that all that aspects of shipping. Yeah, so the PP one thousand Pro will be eight hundred dollars, which is a two hundred dollar increase. Mm-hmm. The SB two thousand Pro goes up to a hundred. Uh, goes up a hundred dollars. The PB two thousand Pro. Uh, so the ported. So the, remember the yep. PB is ported. SB is not. Uh, the PB Pro uh, two thousand Pro will go up two hundred bucks to eleven hundred bucks. The PC 2000 Pro Cylinder will also be $1,100, which is only a $150 increase because less bracing. On the you inside. still get the isolation feet built into there. So that's there's right. that there part. You go. Mm-hmm. So that's like 60 bucks right there. Right. Uh, 3000 Micro, which is the brand new one, goes up $100 to $900. Mm-hmm. That's where that's going. Then we're going to skip over and, a few. <laughs> yeah, up at the top there, the SB16 Ultra and PB16 Ultra go up by $300 and $400 respectively. And on the speaker side we've got the prime series all the towers are up by 100 bookshelf center and elevation go up 50 bucks the satellites will be 40 dollars more for the black ash and uh 25 dollars more for the white or black gloss which i guess they're doing those in house and that's why it's not quite as bad well know, they're just smaller maybe. there's there's less material yeah. for the satellites yeah. going on there so oh 25 dollars more than the black ash version 
So... No, no, no. So the Black Ash version went up by forty dollars of the satellites, and the Gloss version went up twenty five dollars of the satellites. Oh, okay. That's the, right. the least the least increase out of anything that went on. Right. The Ultra Series, the towers go up three hundred dollars. Bookshop Center surrounds all, all go up by hundred bucks each. Uh, all right. The accessory and Prime Wireless pieces uh, prices don't appear to be changing. All of this means that for now, at least, mono price monolith subwoofers look even more attractive. Uh, price wise, of course, they're they're only ported, so there's no sealed button models to begin with, and all of them, all of them are out of stock. So at the moment, uh, at the time we're recording this, every yeah. single mono price monolith subwoofer is out of stock. Uh, but yeah, so all these... of them have ETAs in October for the most part. Right, I think which one, is funny because we have the, the prices are set to go up in SVS in October, and these right. are set to, to arrive in October, and I'm like. Hmm. Might yeah, be seeing some price increases there too. It's so. not impossible for the time being. They're still listed at their old prices. So I mean, yeah. sort of without question, the best five hundred dollar sub that is still out there, at least presently still published, is the Monolith Ten. The right. Monolith Ten is still five hundred dollars, and that is still a beast of a subwoofer. And you're not going to find anything better than that for five hundred dollars right now. But uh, they won't ship it to you right this second because they're out of stock. Hmm. So Roku announced their new Roku Streaming Stick 4K. It's an E 4K, E, stream, e streaming. Roku, I mean, it's not e, Max. E Roku, like, not yet. Anyways. It's not Max, so that's why it's only $50 instead of 55 Right, <laughs> the headline feature is that it does Dolby Vision now in, in addition to HDR10, HDR10+. $50 mm -hmm. and ships October 14th. That's the one. Uh, LG is making their DV LED. Direct view LED modular displays available to consumers, wealthy consumers, anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, that's to take on Samsung's the wall. So this is the micro LED displays that I have been saying are the future. Right. I think Rob has also been saying that they are the future, but we will see eventually. Uh, yeah. So each model is 27 inches diagonal, 16 by nine, and they have three different pixel pitches: uh, 1.5 millimeters, 1.2 millimeters, both of which are technically mini LEDs, and 0.93 millimeters, which is the only version small enough to technically be called micro LEDs. By putting together grids ranging from three by three up to 12 by 12, the smallest option is a, a 81 inch 1080p display, while the largest is a 393 inch 4K display. The only 8K offering is 325 inches, and the smallest 4K model is 163 inches diagonal. So as compared to yeah, right. 110, the 110 inch version of Samsung's The Wall that sells for $155,000, $155,000. The prices for LGs range from 70 grand up to 1.7 million. So take that, Samsung. <laughs> There's also the option to put two 16 by 9 displays side by side with no gap for a 32 by 9 display, for those of you that can do math in your head. <laughs> Interestingly, they use LG's Alpha 7 processor, so that's it's not even their highest end Alpha 9 Gen 4 processor, but they do have LG's dynamic tone mapping and are spec to produce 1200 nits. Other considerations are weight, power, usage, and heat. The basic 108-inch 1080p model weighs over 257 pounds uses almost 1800 watts per hour and generates six, 600 i'm sorry 6000 btu so you know yeah. cook an egg on it <laughs> while you're at it good stuff yeah you put that mini split right above that bad boy <laughs> just right above it a little just more than that i mean you gotta have like a 8000 btu air conditioner directly above it just to equal out what it's putting out i know just to put it yeah <laughs> so if you spring for the 8k model it's over 20 uh, 2200 I almost said it right and thought it was wrong because in my That's head right. it sounded wrong <laughs> it's over 2200 pounds uses 16,000 watts and generates 56 B 56,000 BTU so <laughs> you know it needs its own AC like standalone AC nothing stops a train unit I mean that is that is commercial level air conditioning I mean who has a That's home ludicrous. air conditioning within one room that is equaling out 56,000 BTUs of heat. That is That's, a I mean, lot I mean, of I mean, heat. I mean, I mean, they're very big anyway. So what, 325 diagonal? I mean, that's yeah. not a room in your house. That's outdoors someplace. So who cares how much heat it gives off? It just goes off into the air <laughs> where it kills birds and destroys the atmosphere. I don't think that heat does that, but whatever. No. Though it could cook a bird. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, if you were like, is there an alternative to the wall that I can buy at home? These exist. 
These That's exist. What's going on? You're going to want the smallest one. The smallest, smallest is 81. Is? It's technically That's possible like... to get an 81. There's a three by three grid using the 0.93 millimeter pixel pitch version, so you can get. But that's that you know 1080p only. So that that's seventy thousand dollars. So do you want to buy that or do you want to buy a 83 inch OLED for fifty five hundred dollars? That's 4K resolution. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Mm. It's basically the same thing. Uh, some comments from our listeners. Carl noted that uh, used NX series JVC projectors are selling for somewhat higher prices than you might expect. That's bad news for anyone hoping to find a killer deal, but it's good news for anyone who already owns a JVC projector and is thinking of upgrading to one of the new NZ laser models, NZ laser models. Yeah. Um, for so, now. So he was like, for him and for other people who already own an NX and were considering, hey, maybe I should upgrade to the new NZ, new NZ. Uh, he's like, hey, the, the, they're selling for pretty uh, pretty healthy prices there. So it yeah. makes the sting of going up to at least $10,000 for the uh, NZ7. Uh, it takes a little of the sting out of it if you can recoup a bunch of the money you spent on your NX model. Something to consider. Anthony, this comes from Twitter, bought a Sofa Baton U1 remote. He was not able to get it to pair via Bluetooth to a Samsung S21 Ultra phone. I haven't even heard of that phone. Is that one of the bendy ones? No, um, no, it's not one of the foldable ones because that, uh, what is that, the fold and the flex? So no, this, is their, this is their S series. Their I can't stand series. Samsung's UI. I just can't, I can't <laughs> stand it. I've, I've, I've interacted with one of their tablets and went, this is just awful. I'm not dealing with this anymore. I've never bought a Samsung phone since <laughs> Google. Since I think Google paired with them for like one of the Nexus phones very early. And that's the only Samsung phone mm. I've ever owned. Uh, he was about ready to return the U1, but then he tried pairing it with his old phone, a OnePlus 8, and his daughter's iPhone, and both of those worked fine. So in the end, he likes the Sofa Baton U1, but if you're having trouble getting to pair, it might just be the specific model of phone or tablet, or maybe Samsung just sucks. <laughs> It is a very new model, so hopefully a firmware update or app d update or both will get it yeah. working. Uh, the Sofa Baton guys are pretty darn responsive, so it wouldn't shock yeah. me if they had an up app update pretty quick. But uh, yeah, yeah, ran into that trouble at first, but thankfully it uh, wasn't just that he bought a lemon. It was something okay. to do with that specific model of phone. All right. Let's get some questions here. Yeah. Fred says that based on our podcast, he's purchased the Denon X3400H from Accessories for Less, as well as a pair of Yamaha outdoor speakers that he mounted for Atmos. He's happy with those and glad he listened to us and didn't spend a lot on the Atmos speakers. The rest of his speakers are Wharfdale, plus an old Infinity subwoofer that he's had for years. Guess what I'm going to say about that subwoofer? Hmm. I'm just tell you right now. Anyways, he is finishing his basement, and there's an 11 and a half by 18 and a half area that you can use as a theater. He can have full light control, so he's thinking it might finally be time to upgrade from a 65-inch plasma to a 4K HDR projector. Yeah, somebody's got money to burn. Right off the top, somehow, he has it in his mind that rather than put up a wall with a door, he'd rather put a thick, dark curtain across the 18 and a half span to use as an acoustic barrier. So we have an article over at AV Gadgets as to why that's not going to work. <laughs> I will link it up. I will link it up to Rob, who will link it up in the show yes, notes. Yes, I so shall. You're going you're gonna to want to read that because it's not going to work, and there's all the reasons, and there's so many. Uh, imagine if you tried to fill up your room with water, and you used a, 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 a water-resistant curtain mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to keep the water in that's how good it's going to work <laughs> anyways that wasn't stated as a question in this email but we have to address that first the total area of his basement is 1500 square feet so about 11,000 um, yeah 11,000 to 12,000 cubic feet in volume depending on ceiling height and it's all open uh yeah so you should build a wall yes uh, yes you should <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just start there uh i honestly think that building a wall and in order to you know seal off this area and then getting subwoofers in order to fill that area with base will be cheaper than mm. trying to get subwoofers that will fill the entire area with yeah. base, which yeah. is something you probably don't want to do. I think it might be in the end cheaper, depending on how, how much you can do yourself and all of that. I mean, this mm -hmm. is not a load-bearing wall. It just no. has to be a physical barrier that you fill up with insulation. And I mean, yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff to try to keep the... Um, Try to keep it from uh, uh, you know, sound transmission from into the other mm -hmm. space. But if you were going to have it open anyways, you don't really care. We just want to keep the base in the side of the room. So putting up a wall with a door uh, would, I think, almost be cheaper in the long run. Let me find that article for you. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I, honestly, putting up 
a curtain that in your mind would be heavy enough to potentially block any sound across an 18 and a half foot span. That's not even a trivial thing like that. Oh, you, <laughs> you, know. you know, when you go into the, you go to get your x-ray, right? Mm -hmm. And they give, they, they put that love, that, uh, that <laughs> lead filled apron sure. on you. Right. That's what you need. Floor to ceiling sealed with, uh, all the way across the 18 and a half foot right. thing. Yeah. Like there, so, there you know. are sound dampening curtains that are like mass loaded vinyl. That's what mm -hmm. they're filled with. They're very heavy. Uh, and that's what I mean. Hanging that across an 18 and a half foot span, that, doing that is not a trivial thing. So, I mean, I don't want to say there's literally no such thing as a curtain that blocks some sound because those mass loaded vinyls do block some, but... They don't work great in the bass, and I'm sure if you're putting in home theater, half the idea is to finally have some really good, powerful pressurizing bass, and they're not going to seal that in. Um, they're not cheap. Uh, it's not a, a trivial thing to put it up there. Moving those curtains back and forth is not a super easy thing. So, I mean, putting up a non-load-bearing wall, and if, if you were going to be okay with the amount of sound that would have leaked through any type of curtain, then you don't even need a staggered stud wall. I mean, just a no. just a basic two by four wall with drywall uh, attached directly to the studs on either side, which is not gonna be a soundproof wall, but compared to a curtain is gonna be much more soundproof than a curtain. Especially if you just fill it up with like the cheap pink insulation. That's right. As well, you know, just, just fill all that up and get a solid core door. You're gonna have so That's much right. better sound isolation, which it won't be great. It'll just be a lot better. And if you do want good sound isolation a staggered stud wall and in fact you could do a staggered stud wall with two by threes instead of two by fours to save right. some space if you want it's just having the drywall that's on the inside of the theater is not attached to the same studs as the drywall that's on the outside of the theater that's really all we're talking about when we're going for better soundproofing you do that with uh if you can use the spray in insulation i'm talking like spray in cellulose or the uh shredded up blue jeans that they spray in there if you can do that it does a better job of working its way through a staggered stud wall better than just putting in the pink insulation but i mean if you can do that uh then your soundproofing is going to be way way better than a curtain and it's going to be better than just a regular uh stick frame wall so i am all for doing a wall and even if you're thinking maybe i'm going to sell this place in the not too distant future i want to be able to open the basement back up a simple non-load bearing party wall just separating the theater from the rest of your basement is not that difficult to take back down if we're being right. honest so uh all the way put up a wall so he asked that his first actual question <laughs> was not the first question that we discerned from his description of what his plan I, I was. I just couldn't we... let that go without <laughs> remarking on it. It, must, it had to be remarked upon. <laughs> yeah. So what specific brand and color of paint do we recommend for theater walls? And again, there's an article over AV Gadgets, which How addresses all this. Uh, but it is the Sherwin-Williams... Uh, a theater gray what's it called uh so the name is gray screen if you just want to search for it, it. Uh, and that is the lightest shade in the sherwin williams 707 series so there's 707 one that's gray screen and then 707 two and on upwards and they get darker and darker as the number ticks up uh and yeah those are have been tested to be extremely neutral gray. They have no color tint towards any particular right. color. Extremely neutral gray. Go as dark as you want and try to go for a finish that is not too reflective. Uh, they have one. I think the actual flattest is called flat. And then they have matte, which is one step above flat. Both of those are not necessarily my top recommendation simply because if you if your sh shirt sleeve brushes against it, you'll see the mark on the flat or the mat. You have right. to be pretty careful with those. The one step above those two is called velvet. Uh, that's the finish I went for in my theater. I'm very happy with it. It is in no way shiny, but it is ever so slightly more durable than the mm. uh, matte or the flat finishes. And I think that's a very good compromise. So that's my recommendation there. So he plans to carpet the theater area. What else should he do in ways of in in the way of acoustic treatments? He's considering a drop ceiling, a drop tile ceiling. Mm -hmm. Regardless, that would make the theater uh, theater area ceiling height at seven and a half feet. Mm -hmm. He was then thinking about uh, four two by four two foot by four foot acoustic mm -hmm. panels, but will that be enough? Can I say no? Um, thick thickest pad underneath your carpet that um, mm -hmm. you can afford or that they'll they'll give you. Uh, the thicker the better. It's just 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 more better uh, sound absorption. Uh, generally speaking, in a in any given room, I want uh, 
I mean, if you're going by two two feet by four foot panels, I probably want his his room was eighteen and a half by twelve and a half. Is that right? So uh, yeah, I think that's what he said. Uh, one behind, eleven and a half by eighteen and a half. Yeah, one one by at the first reflection point point on by on each side wall by the front left and right speakers. Mm -hmm. So that's two at least. Uh, Probably two on the back wall to catch to catch yeah. the back the the slap echo. So two back there. That's four. Uh, I want uh, probably two up front if I can fit them, depending on what kind of screen and stuff you're yeah, going maybe with. Maybe three um, if it actually works behind your center. Yeah, so like six one or behind, seven oh. by then. Yeah, and then uh, whatever corners you're not using for a uh, subwoofer store, you know, placement. If you are putting them in corners, which in a twelve and a half foot room i would almost certainly think that you were going to put them mm -hmm. in, in the corners then the other two corners i want you know either chunk traps or try traps from gick so that's another or at least many. trap straddling so at least another four <laughs> right so seven and a half feet with a drop tile ceiling i mean i'm imagining you're only going for i, th I mean I, th I can't imagine this basement area is going to be any taller than eight feet right I mean, it seems unlikely. Yeah, seven and a half so, is what he's talking about. Yeah. So he's going to have a six-inch drop tile ceiling up there. You know, which oh, right. of course, you know, uh, you can use for installing your, you know, overhead speakers and mm -hmm. can lights and all that. And you can fill that up with insulation as well, just like we talked about before. Yeah. Make sure you're getting acoustic tiles up there, the good ones, not the crap ones that will actually either absorb sound or let the the base, which was the thing we'd be most worried about, passing through so that it can hit the insulation that's on the other side of it. So uh, that should give you plenty of uh, absorption all around your your room. And so that's more like what? 10 to 12. 10, 10 to 12 10 to panels. 12, yeah. uh, that's inclusive of four base traps, which we're hoping would be thicker and straddling corners or, or just be super chunk traps that you make yourself and go in the corners. Um, yeah, I did want to address just a little bit. Uh, we've touched upon it before in the past two weeks, but that drop tile ceiling, uh, because again, if you're thinking soundproofing in any way, uh, the drop tile ceiling by itself, there are such things as uh, drop tiles that go in the ceiling that are decent at being a sound barrier themselves, but those have a solid backing or, uh, and or a mass loaded vinyl backing, uh, which does not let sound through. That's the whole idea. So if you get those, then all the area above those drop ceiling tiles does not count as room absorption anymore. If it is the type of sound blocking ceiling tiles that have a solid right. layer on their back. Uh, now, we're perfectly fine with going with just the regular one inch thick or even three quarter inch thick acoustic ceiling tiles and then having insulation directly above them. And then all of that now counts as room absorption. And that would let you... You, you could get away with a little bit less in terms of just room reverberation uh, panels, but you're still going to want to treat the reflection points. So the first reflection points on the sides, the back wall. Maybe you, you could probably... That's one where if your whole ceiling acts as absorption, you could probably get away without the front wall treatment, to be honest. Um, right. and, and you might not need as much base trapping, but the whole thing is there, if you're using like one inch or three quarter inch uh, absorptive ceiling tiles and then insulation directly above them, that's not a great sound barrier. You know, sound upstairs is going to be damped. It's going to be a bit muffled, particularly voices aren't going to get through very well. But again, the bass, the bass can get right through all of that stuff. If you want sound proofing for the theater, you need some kind of solid layer. Now, that could be mass loaded vinyl that's attached directly to the ceiling joists. And then mm -hmm. you still have a six inch gap below that. And that can all be insulation. So that could be fine. Or you could put drywall directly against your joists or resilient channel and then drywall and then put your drop tile ceiling below that. But you need some kind of solid barrier if you want sound blocking, sound proofing, and then below the solid area is where all the insulation needs to be to count as room treatment. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Uh, cost is consideration. So he's mainly looking at the BenQ HT3550 for his choice of projector. What budget-friendly screen should he buy? He's thinking 120 inches would be the perfect size for him. So he's 18 feet. I'm, I'm betting this guy wants two rows of seats and everything. But 120 inches is a very standard size. And it sure if is. you're going to do a go with a fixed frame screen, mm -hmm. you're going to want to get the screen that's behind me, <laughs> which is the silver ticket screen. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's not going to cost more than a couple couple hundred bucks. I mean, two hundred and sixty dollars right now. If you're getting it directly from them, that is true. a very nice three-inch thick 
Uh, is it felt or velvet covered? I think it's felt covered, isn't it? Because they're keeping the price down a little bit there. But a very nice three inch thick black frame all around, just a fixed frame, tensioned white screen. And that is absolutely all you need in here. 260 bucks will do you. Silver ticket is the place to get that. Yeah, perfectly good screen. They're, they're not the easiest thing in the world to put together, but they're certainly not hard. Just follow the instructions. Right. And you um, only got to do it once. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he likes a 45 degree field of view. Would sitting 10 feet from the 120 inch uh, screen put him at the right distance? Does he need to be closer or farther away? There is a calculator for this. And oh, okay. I know Rob's already done it, but yeah. let me let me see if I can find it real quick so that okay. we can link, link it up for people. Yeah, that'd be good. I, I just do the math on my own manually. So if we're talking exactly a 45 degree field of view with exactly a 120 inch screen, then the math says that you need to be 10 and a half feet eyes to screen to give you exactly the 45 degree degree field of view now 10 feet is not far off the mark whatsoever and if that's basically where your seats are when they're not reclined versus you're going to be a little bit your eyes are going to be a little bit farther away when you are reclined then 10 feet totally works you're well within the ballpark if your eyes are precisely 10 feet from the screen then a 45 degree field of view would be achieved with precisely a 114 inch diagonal screen <laughs> that's that's how the math would work out and it looks as though tom did find a link to the viewing distance calculator so that will be linked up in the show notes okay mm -hmm. uh, calculate uh <laughs> see if it actually out. works <laughs> no he wants a uh, main oh geez <laughs> so diagonal size 120 inches yeah uh and he's he wants to know how many feet to set yeah is that how that works okay so this one doesn't do it that way okay you have it'd be to, some trial you, and error yeah you, but you try putting in put, 10 and put a half feet 10.5 calculate that's 45.1 okay there you go <laughs> there you go pretty spot sorry. on sorry I, I have to go uh all right gary infinite gary so audio Holics posted the video about micro led displays and how they present the challenge on the audio side because they aren't acoustically transparent but they can be big enough that putting speakers either above or below can be awkward and suboptimal mm -hmm. everybody can let me, let me tell you what suboptical uh, opt optimal suboptimal other than me not being able to say that is finding a reason to complain about everything <laughs> just just get irritated with people well, for... if you put a 325 inch micro led you're display, not you're... sitting very yeah. close to that it thing might not and it have doesn't a whole lot of space below <laughs> that to the floor anymore you know that's that might be what's going on with that whatever <laughs> just you don't need you don't need a center channel you just have two massive speakers on either side and that'll be wide enough they're, for any seating distance yeah, that you might possibly apart be that at. everybody's got to be in between them everybody's in between them <laughs> so at one point it's mentioned that having speakers away from the walls and a fair distance into the room is ideal but then they also say that the best home theaters typically have the speakers behind an acoustically transparent screen so that doesn't seem to compute so what can, can we make sense of it no can i do can i just say that <laughs> First of all, I don't, I see all the time, especially on Reddit, which is starting to break my brain. Like mm. I, going there is making me dumber, but uh, I see people and they get an acoustically transparent screen uh -huh. and then they put all three speakers mm. behind mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and then they're sitting like 10 feet away from a, like a hundred inch screen. I'm okay. like, so the, the, the speakers, they're not even as wide as the couches. Right. You know, the left and right speaker aren't even as wide as the yeah. couch. Yeah. But because it's an acoustically transparent screen, they want to put everything behind it. Sure, that's and what they envisioned. That's, yeah. That's what they envisioned. But they're, they're not thinking about what actually is good for sound or what mm -hmm. will actually make a good listening experience. They, they basically have mono up front at this point. <laughs> like the speakers I mean, are like... not quite that bad, but... Th yeah. It is pretty close, though. It's, <laughs> the speakers are like a foot and a half at most away from each other oh, behind okay. the screen. You know what I mean? So and it's it's like a 92-inch screen going on up there, yeah. Well, and they have towers, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. behind it. It's ridiculous. So, yeah. you know, when I think of an acoustically transparent screen, I don't just think of the screen. I think of the entire wall mm -hmm. being acoustically transparent, and therefore you right. can put the speakers wherever you want them to be. Sure. Yeah. And that's sort of the way I envision that to be. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, this idea of getting, you know, an acu like like in a in a movie theater, mm -hmm. yes, the entire the entire front wall, oh, yeah, which yeah. is massive, is filled with a screen so yes it's acoustic but that's not what your house is 
And if and you're, it's almost never the case. If you've gone for a field of view that's greater than 45 degrees, because you, you still have the width of the speakers themselves, so you're going to be closer right. to something like a 50 degree field of view. And some people really like that. Like, you know, we know Carl and his wife, they like like a 60 degree field of view. So if if that's what you're going for, if you're sitting close enough to your screen that you're ending up with a about a 50 degree field of view or larger, well then all three of your speakers can go behind your screen because you want right. a 45 degree spread at minimum between your front left and front right speakers. Between a 45 degree spread up to a 60 degree spread. That's the range. That's what all the Dolby and DTS and Atmos and everything speaker placement guideline diagram will show you at least they all agree on that much uh, but the minimum is a 45 degree spread uh, plus or minus 22 and a half degrees to the left and right so that but, tells you where the edges of the screen would need to be if they're all going to be behind the screen right and so if you if you think about that and you think about okay so I can't get my my my, my speakers behind the screen for mm -hmm. whatever reason and but my screen is very big and very mm -hmm. far away so what do I do with my speakers? Do I just have them flanking? Well, you could, but then you have to have extremely powerful, extremely efficient speakers with big amps behind them or, mm -hmm. or to get the sound to you at, or at reference volume or even close to reference volume. So how do you fix that? You move them forward and you cheat them in, basically, <laughs> and you still get that same angle. And they're not in your field of view. They're not blocking the screen. But now you don't need the amplifier power, and you don't need uh, to buy the the super effective, uh, super efficient speakers, or the horn loaded designs, or the compression <laughs> tweeters, and all this other stuff. Instead, you can just buy regular speakers, move them into the room so they're twelve feet away from, or, or you know, fifteen, twelve feet away from you, and suddenly you can power them with a receiver. So, <laughs> you know, it's it, it's essentially you're you're solving the same problem in two different ways either you have such a big screen like rob's saying that you can still get 45 degrees between the mm -hmm. speakers you know and they still are behind the screen which is rare i think it's rare uh or you have a you know or you pull them out from behind the screen and you have them flanking either side and then you pull them into the room so that you have more options as to speakers because you're really you know you put your speakers 20 feet away from you and you are suddenly limiting yourself quite a bit to either the speakers or everything else that goes along behind it for the amplification so but as far as gary's specific question about what was going on in the audioholics video i mean they were just they were talking about two different scenarios at two different times right. you know they were just referring to the fact that yes if you look at basically all the designs of the high-end theaters that you know erskine and grimani and all the rest of them are are putting in and, and showing the pictures on their site and the testimonials on all that. Yeah, they're all being designed with acoustically transparent screens and all the speakers hidden. You know, even if they're yeah. actually cabinet in room speakers, everything is put behind stretched fabric walls because none of their clients want to ever see a speaker. That's the type of people they're dealing with. So, of course, they're going to say, okay, in the highest end, you know, professionally designed theaters, you don't see any speakers. So, yes, you're going to have a false wall up front, even if they design it correctly and only the center is actually behind behind the screen, they still have a false wall up front so that the front left and right, maybe to the outside edges of the screen, but they're still not visible. They're behind a, right. you know, tr uh, acoustically transparent wall. Uh, and then the other side of it was just saying, okay, if we're just talking strictly acoustics, we're not talking about aesthetics at all, where would you ideally position speakers? It would be away from the walls. It would be three feet or more away from the walls so that you don't have that boundary reinforcement thing going on in any type of range that causes an issue. You'd have them that far away. The alternative is if you're you know tight on space and you want to have things behind acoustically transparent well then you go for a baffle wall design so that they're the the front of the speaker is flush with the front of the wall and the front wall is all absorptive so you get rid of the boundary effects that way so that's all they were talking about in the video so so if and when we go to a movie theater mm -hmm. do we find ourselves counting the number of speakers on the walls and ceiling is it just him uh yeah it's just you I mean, I look to see how many there are. In Atmos speakers in particular, uh, Atmos theaters in particular, I mm -hmm. have been known to like look around and be amazed at how many speakers there are overhead. Okay. Uh, but uh, in normal theaters, I'm always like, oh, there's like five, four on the side walls and yep. three on the back wall, and however many there are behind the, the screen that I can't see, and I don't really pay much attention to it. And but I, yes, I do. Say, I do look. I can say it's not just you, Gary. I have counted them. I have I mm. literally counted them. So Gary still likes to use WinApp, WinApp, amp? WinAmp, WinAmp, to mm -hmm. listen to podcasts on his laptop. But some podcast episodes just won't open. Mm -hmm. Is there 
an easy setting to change that that will let him open every podcast in WinAmp. I'm like, I have not touched that program in <laughs> add some, a add some older desert, software. Dozen years? I don't know. I haven't remembered the last time I touched that thing. I mean, so I it, no it does support MP3. It does support AAC. But I believe it's the podcast that put chapters in that WinAmp oh, yeah. doesn't work with the uh, ones that have chapters. So I'm not aware of any setting in WinAmp itself that'll let that work. You could, what, like reconvert it i mean i guess you could open up the podcast in like audacity and then resave it as a non-chaptered mp3 uh sure. so if you want to go through that then it'll play in WinApp, or you could just switch over to something like vlc that plays anything and it still has a pretty easy interface and takes up no computer resources so i think those are two solutions das Daz says we successfully talked him down from giving in to FOMO and replacing his Ascend SE series speakers with RBH signature speakers that you can't really afford right now. Mm. Good for us. <laughs> but, you know, prices are going up all over the place, so you might want to jump on that. Oh, God. <laughs> yep. I am not a good friend. <laughs> oh, so I'm uh, I'm on the market. I'm looking for a new bike. Um, I'm, I'm not actually shopping less. Yet, I'm talking about it because we have a motorcycle that neither one of us has ridden in years. We right. bought it. We loved riding motorcycles in, in Perth when we were there. And then we moved here where it's, you know, Mad Max mm. highways. And, you know, uh, neither one of us felt very safe. Mm -hmm. And then it's also very, very hot. And neither mm. one of us will ride without full gear. Because right. we've seen what happens to people mm -hmm. who fall off and don't have full gear on. So, it's so hot that there's like like two months out of the year that we'll even consider it and it's just not worth it so we're gonna sell the motorcycle and i'm gonna use some of that money hopefully to buy a, a a bike so i have a friend who's already shopping for me and he's like i found this great bike tom we gotta go look at it i'm like mm. i don't have any money yet he goes no no no, you gotta go look at it i'm like <laughs> you're not a, you're not a good friend daz i'm that friend for you there you go so anyways uh daz has got some other ideas in mind for how to spend money i mm -hmm. really think you should look at those rbhs though i mean i'll be honest with you know, just <laughs> I honestly don't know if there's even any left available. I know. They're I'm working joking. on new stuff over there. So uh, he, he'd, like, he'd really like to free up some floor space at the front of his room. Right now, his Ascend CMT 340 SE front speakers are on pedestal stands, basically looking like towers. He's considering wall mounting them instead. Uh, I cannot see them. Am I yes, the whole front wall is them? black, and uh, they are there to the left and the right of the screen. The center is directly below. Uh, you can kind of sort of see it, yes. They pretty much blend into that black wall up there, which is the idea. So the B-Tech B5, uh, BT77 side clamping wall mounts are rated to hold 55 pounds, and the CMT340s weigh 26 pounds. So even though they're big, that should work, right? He's thinking he'll reinforce across uh, a couple of studs to make sure the wall mounts are very sturdy. Do we have any suggestions that we think would work better? A shelf? <laughs> Technically, yeah. a shelf. Although, will work I mean, I guess, well, too? well I mean, you can still I mean, tow in if they're on a shelf, so that's not really an issue. I mean, and you shouldn't need to thing, angle them vertically. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, if so, the shelf, if anything else, is going to be cheaper almost certainly especially if you mm. build it yourself because you can like you can get just l brackets that mm. will hold a million pounds i mean all you have to do <laughs> is find a stud and stick them in there but even without that there are you know drywall anchors that are super sturdy that are rated to hold like 300 mm. pounds i don't know how they are supposed to do that on drywall but they say they can do it so <laughs> if you find a stud for one of the l brackets right. I mean, you're pretty much good to go. Whatever you do with the other side, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and then you have shelves <laughs> that yeah. nobody's going to look at and go, well, other than that whole front wall being black, which is weird, <laughs> at least it's a shelf, right, that you can do something that, that people will understand. Um but yeah, the 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 I don't I don't have the link here for these B techs, but the anything that's rated within the the range of what that. Uh, speaker mm -hmm. ways should be fine. Uh, the side clamping ones, the, the, the thing I found when I was re researching them for a AV Gadgets article a while back was that a lot of them uh, kind of rely on taking a screw and, you know, almost screwing it into mm. the side of your speaker. And that's sort of the thing that I don't much like about them. You know, yeah, the only tend... thing that gives me a little pause on the side clamping mounts is that the CMT340 speakers are so tall 
Right. So having that sitting on the fairly small, you know, actual base that the stands, uh, that the side clamping mounts provide, and then sort of relying on the side clamping and maybe having to screw into the MDF cabinet, which you can do, but of course, once you take them out, then that will have marred the finish. Um, I'm more in favor of, yeah, a couple of L brackets on your front wall. I mean, you could even, if you're really worried about it, you could still put a span of wood across a couple of studs and then put your L brackets into that, you know, if, exactly. that's, if that's what you yeah. want to do that way and um and also i actually think if you went l brackets with your own shelf that would give you even more floor space clearance than having the uh you know the side clamping wall mounts that would have to stick out and have their whole base underneath the speaker if you've got the l brackets then that gives you even more height clearance so i'm in favor of just shelves on your front wall yeah so Daz is 6'1", and his teenage boys are growing like weeds. Right now, his projector is mounted on the ceiling right above the second row of seats, which is on a, they're, they're on a riser. And somebody keeps bumping the projector and knocking it out of alignment. Well, you need to start knocking some heads around, Daz. That's how you fix that problem, Daz. Start getting serious dad justice going on in here. Next person touches that projector, loses, loses their hair. How about that? Mm. Go take them to the bathroom. <laughs> It's I've actually shaved my, my my kids my kids hair before. I've actually mm. done that. They, they had lice, so I mean ah. that was that was the reason I did it. But uh -huh. it was very satisfying. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. So he's thinking he wants to move the projector forward and as close to uh, up to the ceiling as possible. He's already got a peerless mount and it's a drop tile ceiling. So what's the procedure for securing a bracket to the floor joist above the drop ceiling, extending down through a drop ceiling tile with the with an N P T pole and then mounting the projector. Any advice before he tackles this projector, this project, I'm sorry, would be appreciated. I seriously think you should just tell those kids to stop it. <laughs> I mean, th there's I, that. I, that I, I mean, every all the stuff that you don't, you know, I mean, money is not. I mean, I mean, you're obviously on a budget because you're not sitting there with brand new R B H speakers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would just like. Guys, what the heck is wrong with you two idiots? You can't not bump my projector. You're not allowed in here anymore. That's all there is to it. You can't come in mm. until you can figure out how to walk like normal human beings. You <laughs> or hunch, just hunch while you're walking under. Uh, yeah, right. I, it's a projector. You know what you do? You put a little freaking spike on the bottom yeah. of it, like it's like a like a reverse like bird thing. You know, like the bird. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. when birds are stand on stuff, so they put like a bunch of nails sticking out of that. Mm -hmm. Put a little thing on the bottom of that. See how many times <laughs> they run into it after that. Walk so, out of their blood dripping down their face. Yeah, I don't know what happened to my head. I do. You hit the projector, didn't you? No. Uh -huh. Liar. Where he Lie. is mounted right now is a little bit lower than the highest part of his ceiling. So that's where some of this is coming right, in mind. Right. I would say the first thing I have to worry about is get yourself over to projectorcentral.com right. and make sure that if you do move your projector forward, you're still going to have sufficient throw distance from your screen because your screen size isn't changing at this point, I don't imagine. So make no. sure there's going to be sufficient throw distance. But assuming that I would imagine it's going to be moving forward um, too based yeah, on this projector. If, if you this, got drop uh, tile picture, ceiling, so move it's pretty it forward. easy. Yeah. Yeah. And a fair amount, because you got the body of the projector and then the clearance behind the projector for mm -hmm. air. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, calculate all that out. But uh, assuming that all that works, it is a drop tile ceiling, pretty easy. Do have a ceiling tile out of the way, get a view at the joist. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways. I mean, they're just... Uh, uh, pieces of metal that have a 1.5 inch national pipe thread, that's the NPT national pipe thread, standard threading that any hardware store can do for you for any length of metal pipe that you want as long as it's 1.5 inch diameter so that's all you need to go and ask for there uh, but you can have a very basic if you go over to uh, B&H Photo, they've got all of these options, all of them from Peerless so it's even brand for brand, but the very most basic which could just, you know, directly screw into a stud or a cross brace that you put a, uh, through a couple of studs, it's only 13 bucks for the very most basic uh they have one that will actually install into your drop tile ceiling and then you can move it laterally side to side so that you get it aligned properly now that does have to then have additional suspension metal cables uh that go up from this thing that will be holding your projector and uh those have to those metal cables have to secure to the actual ceiling joist so it's a little bit involved to get it all done but this can actually install right into your existing ceiling grid that is available so that goes for 80 bucks to do that. Um, if this if is just going to be exposed on the outside, they do just have a round one, but this is typically for like a drywall, a, a solid ceiling uh, that goes for 20 bucks. Uh, very inexpensive. Now they have one which might be the best option for you, uh, which actually goes in between the studs. 
and then can move laterally as far as exactly where things get screwed in. Uh, so that that's an in-between stud uh, metal sort of box that goes in there that's $78, and then you screw the pipe into that, and then that'll extend down through your ceiling and connect to the mount that you already have. Uh, they do have ones that span across studs, and they come in 16-inch on center, 20-inch on center, or 24-inch on center. So that might be one of the easiest 30 bucks for ones that just span across, but that doesn't give you any lateral movement. So you're going to have to... Uh, uh, you might have to use some of the horizontal lens shift that your Epson projector does have. Uh, but then the last one I'll mention, they do have a anti-vibration mount. Uh, and that might be possibly of interest to you. Um, mm -hmm. It has depth to it because it's basically sort of spring-mounted. The part where the pipe actually goes in is spring-mounted and a little bit separated from the rest of the metal body that's on there. Uh, but yeah, that only goes for $63, so it's not too expensive. Uh, but again, there's no lateral movement on that, so you might have to put a cross brace in and then attach this to the cross brace. Uh, but if you are worried about uh, you know people walking across the floor upstairs and that physical vibration translating down the pipe into your projector, the anti-vibration mount could be a good idea and it's not crazy expensive at all there you go bertrand in quebec bertrand says he hasn't had the time to watch as many movies as he liked in his in his completely blacked out theater he also can't find his seats in there which right in a bigger problem yeah <laughs> but hopefully you'll have a bit more time dude if you lose your remote in that theater you are oh, absolutely yeah. hosed <laughs> yeah that sofa i, I lost my remote for 24 <laughs> hours the other day it was brutal i could not find it my son had taken it put it next to him and it slid down the side of the couch and i looked down there like five times and could not find mm -hmm. it it just kind of wedged itself into a place it was a pain mm -hmm. uh so you know don't lose the remote uh, hopefully I have a bit more time throughout the winter and a bunch of good movies are supposed to be hitting the theaters. I know there's like a bunch of Marvel stuff that I can't wait till it comes out. Like I'm looking forward to the Shang-Chi one or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the Eternals looks, I mean, I'm hoping it's going to be good. Yeah. It looks, it's got a good director. Like, so let's hope on yeah, that part. Yeah, I know, right? And then I mean, the problem with such a big cast, it's going to be hard. It's a huge that, cast. <laughs> that That's the, that's the thing that worries me about that movie mm -hmm. is the size of the cast. So, but anyways. He'd prefer to watch at home in his theater, though. Unfortunately, it isn't easy to figure out ahead of time which movies will only be in theaters and which ones will be available day and date to stream at home. Is there an easy way to tell? Um, yeah, I don't think Disney's doing any more of them, which really depresses me. But Disney's uh, not doing any more of them. They, I mean, they went through what they've HBO gone through. HBO still the... is, though, right? Well, yes, except that we know Bertrand's in Quebec. He's in Canada. And we don't have HBO Max. Right. Now... So if, Bertrand, if you're using a VPN <laughs> and accessing the U.S. version of HBO Max, honestly, it's Warner Brothers movies. That's it from here on out for what's going to be day and date. Disney is not doing any more of them. They did their experiment. They've, they're have they going through this lawsuit with Scarlett Johansson over Black Widow. Uh, they looked at uh, the numbers that they made for the ones that were day and date versus like Shang-Chi that just came out. That was theater only and is the biggest movie of the entire year so far with a character that a lot of people didn't know beforehand but it's marvel and it made 90 million dollars in its opening weekend and they're like hmm that did make more money when it wasn't available day and date on disney plus so uh yeah they've they already announced that all the rest of the disney movies ones that might have been premiere access nope not gonna happen they're gonna have a 45 day uh theatrical exclusive window so really it's just warner brothers warner brothers uh said except for dune dune was the exception dune is going to be theaters only but the rest yeah. of their movies warner brothers said would be day and date available on hbo max now like I mentioned, in Canada, we don't have HBO Max, so the simple answer is if you're sticking to Canadian uh, streaming uh, sources, uh, the answer is zero. <laughs> there are zero movies coming out for the rest of the year in Canada uh, on Canadian streaming services services that will be day and date uh, available at home. So I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but it is a simple answer at least. And if you want yeah. to see them on the first day they're available, you'll have to actually go to the theater. But the good news is 45 days. 45 days is the window now. Um, that doesn't mean it's much be, better. And yeah. Disney Plus, at the very least, you know, uh, if I mean, it depends on what kind of movies you're really looking for. Uh, that is 45 days is not that long I know. to wait. Uh, and then you get to stream it as much as you want. And I'm to me, that's 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 fine. I can I can avoid spoilers mostly. Yeah. Until until then. So. And outside of Disney, because Disney, they are bringing it to Disney Plus uh, after that 45 day window. And that's a pretty good deal, honestly, if I'm being uh, honest of what I think of that. The other ones in Canada, it will be a rental 
at the 45 day point. It's not just going to show up on Crave and be part of your subscription. Um, you know, although you probably wouldn't want to watch those movies on Crave anyway, since it's 1080p and two channel audio over on Crave. Woo-hoo. They still haven't upgraded anything. So those are rentals. You know, you go to iTunes or go to Google Play or whatever else. Uh, I guess even the Cineplex uh, streaming that, that we have, uh, you could get it there. But yeah, those are going to be rentals after the 45 days. Yeah. Uh, he says, if you buy a physical disc, it comes with a code to get the digital copy. But the physical disc typically comes out a few weeks later than the digital copy release. Mm-hmm. Is there a way to pre-order the physical disc? but get a code ahead of time? Even better would be pre-ordering the disc. Uh, if pre-ordering the disc lets you stream the movie day and date with the theatrical release. They're just <laughs> not doing that. They're not doing it. They're not doing I mean, it. I agree it would be nice, but no, that's that last part isn't happening. Uh, let's see. They buy... want you to go to the theater and see it, and then they want you to buy it later. They don't want you to do right. just one of those things. They want you to do both. That's how they make all of the money. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I recall there were uh, a few movies at one time where if you did pre-order specifically on Amazon, they allowed you to watch the Amazon version online oh. ahead of when the disc was shipping. Okay. Uh, but I haven't seen that deal going on for I think a couple of years at this yeah, point. Yeah, I haven't. I don't know if I <laughs> if I remember that at all. Yeah, that was like you. vaguely ringing a bell in the back of my mind. But um, I mean, so I I agree those would be nice consumer friendly ideas. But they're not really in the business of being consumer friendly. They're in the business no. of trying to make as much money as they possibly can. So they want uh, a double, triple, quadruple dip. They absolutely. would like you to buy the movie, then they would like you. I mean, they, they would like, like you to go, go to the theater, movie theater. Yeah. Then they would like you to stream it on demand. That's right. And then they would like you to buy the physical disc. That's right. And pay a subscription to watch it after the fact. That's right. So he made his acoustic panels and installed two on each side wall in front of the seats, uh, i.e. at the first reflection points, two on the front wall, and two on the back wall. He was also going to make super chunk corner base traps, but he just hasn't had the time yet. Mm -hmm. His initial plans were to have one more panel on each side wall, a bit behind the seats, but should those be diffusion panels instead? And what about the ceiling? I, I I just don't believe in diffusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I know it exists. It's a thing. I, I just go don't go that far. You can see I the don't, measured results. I don't. I just generally speaking believe that <laughs> that diffusion diffusion is uh, offers a fraction of the benefit that you get for from just absorption. So. Mm. If you really want to have like a combo panel, mm-hmm. I'm fine mm-hmm. with that mm-hmm. uh, back there. But uh, yeah, I mean, Rob has diffusion over his head mm-hmm. because of things he measured. I have no diffusion in here except for just the unevenness of things in the room. Uh, you know, things sticking out. And I have a little <laughs> bookshelf in the back that has some, uh, it's off to the side, but it's back there. It has the stuff in there. Um some discs and some speakers that I'm not using. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't, I just don't think it's that important. But. Well, that's that's that part, but we'll... All right, so he found diffusion panels on sale, but they're around $800 to $900 Canadian from <laughs> Vico, Vicoustic? Vicoustic. Vicoustic, yeah. Vicoustic. They appear to be solid wood and heavy, so he's concerned that securing them to his walls and ceilings, which are all mounted on sound clips and hand channels, might compromise the soundproofing, and he definitely doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So are there better diffusion panels to consider? Will they even make a worthwhile difference? Should he prioritize his corner base traps first? Yes on the last thing. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly (laughs) on the last part. Prioritize your corner base traps first, 100%. And then, I mean, you got access to Gick up there. He's in Canada? Are we in Canada? He's in Canada. Still? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Gick will ship to Canada. There is a pretty hefty shipping cost associated with it because they ship via FedEx. But they can't be $800 to $900 for a panel. It is not. (laughs) <laughs> no the one they don't I, start off anywhere near that i don't know what the shipping is but it can't be double or triple yeah, I, I know the ones that he's referring to and there is absolutely no need to pay that much no. um so i mean over I, I mean i would point you to gick i know you know you're thinking i'm putting a lot of money into the shipping cost but in the end you're still paying less and honestly probably getting better performance um yeah. so i mean if you just want straight diffusion and perhaps for your ceiling now I would encourage you to measure beforehand because there's every chance that you don't need 
diffusion on your ceiling. There's every chance that you don't need more diffusion. You're in a small enclosed room. Basically, in a small enclosed room, you can never have too much base trapping. Uh, yeah. And that is more the priority. Uh, it's not impossible to overdamp the room to the point that adding diffusion back in would, again, we're looking at decay times. And we don't want to see uneven decay times. If we see a gradually, you know, a general rise in decay times as we go to deeper and deeper base, we would expect that just because it takes that long for the sound waves to form in the first place. But we don't want uneven decay times. So before you go spending money on diffusion panels, spend a hundred bucks, <laughs> get yourself to Cross Spectrum, Cross Spectrum Labs, and uh, get a U mic one and get some measurements in Rumiki Wizard, and you're going to be wanting to look at the waterfall plots and the RTC. 60 decay times and you're looking for even decay times now if you're noticing in the two to four kilohertz maybe down as far as one kilohertz maybe as high as four kilohertz right in that range if you're noticing uneven decay times that's where diffusion might help you and the ceiling is a is a good place because it often is that first reflection on the ceiling and hanging full absorption panels up there is awkward so you can go with like the grid fusers that's exactly what they're for that price they're showing 214 dollars that's for four of them and they're two feet by two feet you probably only need one package of them so mm. that is definitely less than the eight or nine hundred dollars even after you ship them and they're not heavy so they're not that bad to ship uh as far as the side walls behind your seats i would definitely in your case go for a combo panel because again you can't have too much base trapping and if you just don't want to over damp everything honestly the rounded ones that they have that would probably work best in your room because that delivers some pretty decent base trapping while giving you some diffusion of the higher frequencies to where your surround speakers are going to be bouncing around and that makes a lot of sense if you just like the patterns of the impression or the alpha series those would work well too so that's what i would do but i wouldn't do any diffusion in a room until you've measured hmm. john john has an nvidia uh, shield from 2017 which does not do dolby vision and a 2020 roku ultra both now uh have the apple tv app on the roku everything that is hdr from apple tv looks brighter and more even versus the, how things look coming from the nvidia shield on top of that all the audio is 10 decibels louder than uh, coming out of the rope on top of that all the audio is 10 decibels louder coming out of the roku so the roku is louder yeah things are brighter on the nvidia yeah. shield why is there such a big difference? Is it hardware specific? Well, it could be, or it could, I, Rob's going to tell you, I'm sure, but it could be hardware specific because of settings within the apps. And the NVIDIA Shield is basically a computer. You should be able to like sort that out, but uh, it could also be because of how the apps are programmed and in which case yeah. you can't really do anything about it yeah. so you you answer the question i'm gonna go get some more coffee okay i'll start with the audio side first because uh i suspect i mean there's basically only one thing i have in mind of what to check which is that by default the roku devices do decode all the audio themselves and then output one consistent audio format at all times by default that's what they're set to do uh the roku ultra does have a pass-through option that'll just send whatever bitstream is coming from your streaming uh, app, whatever that app might be, it'll just take the original bitstream and pass it straight through without touching it. Uh, so if you haven't touched the audio settings in the Roku Ultra, and it's doing what it does by default, which is decode everything itself and then put it all into one consistent container, very similar to like what the Xbox uh, One and Xbox Series X uh, did initially before they had bitstream pass through for everything by default, decoded everything, put it into one consistent container. And that is a common thing that when and the Roku is doing that by default. Everything is coming out at this 10 decibels louder level because in general, people like it when it's louder and there's no like flipping between codecs on, uh, you know, their sound bar that they're using. So I think that's the culprit there. On the HDR side, um, my number one suspect, since you were saying that on the Roku, everything in HDR uh, looks brighter and more even from service to service, uh, the NVIDIA Shield by default, when it's putting out HDR, it does put out RG. GB. It is not putting out a YCBCR signal, a YCC signal. By default, the NVIDIA Shield, the 2017 one anyway, does put out RGB. And RGB tends to be a full range signal uh, versus what we call the limited range signal that most video coming from your streaming services is actually encoded in. Uh, so the result is in the full range signal RGB, black is at zero. And every value above that is some kind of shade of gray. 
So if it's outputting zero as black, whereas in the limited range, uh, the code value of 16 is black and everything below that is considered below black. So what happens is if it's outputting zero as black, but then you're showing it on a television that's expecting the limited range, and by default, most TVs are expecting the limited video range. Uh, that means that all the values from 0 to 16, that TV is displaying them as below black, so it crushes everything, whereas the NVIDIA Shield putting out the full range signal, it says, I started at 0, and every value above 0 is supposed to be a shade of gray. So everything looks too dark. So uh, the fix there is to either set the NVIDIA Shield to up output YCC instead of RGB, That'll be one of the options. You have to go into the advanced picture options on the NVIDIA Shield, but choose a YCC output format instead of RGB. Or alternatively, on your television, you're going to want to look for a setting that's typically just called black level. And there's usually auto, low, or high, or auto, limited, and full. And you're going to want to put it in the case of the NVIDIA Shield to full or high, because when it's outputting RGB in the full range, those two things need to match. And usually the TV is set up for limited or low in the uh, black level settings. So I think those are the culprits there. And those should be the fixes. Good. Sounds very good. For mm -hmm. The small amount of the part I heard about that. That's right. Max. Max has his theater in his finished attic space. He added a door like we suggested and acoustically treated the, his room. Also, like we suggested, he did a subwoofer mm -hmm. crawl, which we would have suggested, with sweeps instead of just heavy music, uh, bass heavy music, when, and after listening to us, and wound up with his single SVS PB12 and the ST, more or less in the middle of the right side wall. So we can see this room. He's got a just kind of sitting with an angled wall behind, an uh, angled ceiling behind him. Mm -hmm. He's got some acoustic panels back there, especially looks like above his main listening seat. Yep. And uh, just kind of in that open alcove for the window, which is uh, quite large. Uh, so he's got some acoustic panels there. He's got acoustic panels on the side walls, it looks like. And yes, uh, his couch is, I mean, his uh, sub is indeed on the right side wall. Yep. So he really loves to feel the bass. So he added bass shakers to his couch and he wanted to see what his bass response looked like. So he listened to Rob's Room UQ Wizard tutorial and uh, tried it out for the first time. So he gave us some graphs here. Mm -hmm. uh, his main seat, his right seat, and his left seat, which are all on the same couch. There's no, you know, they're, they're, it looks like they all reclined maybe. I can't really Possibly. tell. Possibly. Three-seater couch. Three-seater couch, definitely. The left one uh, looks like it's got an ottoman attached, or it's like a. That's I don't correct. Know what's, I don't go with and that. that one is and the, the right green one, trace definitely. Yeah. <laughs> on the graph that we're showing, and the green trace is by far the worst. So the left seat is the worst. It's got a a big old null at uh, between about eighty and eighty-five hertz going yeah. on there. There's a big old null there, and then it's got some other squiggles down lower, uh, both a, a dip and a hump. So I mean, for uh, the most part, though, the lines uh, with. The exception of about 31, 32 hertz, where there's mm -hmm. a dip in the that that left that left seat. Mm -hmm. Mostly the lines kind of follow each other. The left seat is it's by not, far the worst seat. It's not too bad, and the main seat, which is of course the one that he did the subwoofer crawl from, is really quite decent. That is yeah, that's not bad one, at that all. Right? That's maybe plus minus five at the worst of it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm surprised the room correction hasn't gotten this closer. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, mm. I mean, I this might know. be, I don't know if this is before or after room correction. I mean, the main yeah. the main seat there, there's only so much it can do because, you know, some of them, uh, like, you know, particularly uh, between 60 and 80 hertz, one seat's going down, the other seat's going up. So EQ is going to kind of leave that alone <laughs> if you've done yes, it properly. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The six between 60 and 80, between 60 sure. and 70 in particular, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, about 31, 32 hertz, uh, it's mm -hmm. also not great. Uh, so all along, he's been considering upgrading to dual subs. It seems like he could uh, get better seat-to-seat -seat uniformity. So which subs exactly? He was leaning towards dual SVS PB2000 Pros, and with their prices going up soon, now would be the time. PB3000s would be a bit too expensive at $1,400 each, and definitely too expensive when they go up to $1,600 each on uh, October 4th. Remember, mm -hmm. they do get a dual sub discount, but... I'm not going to recommend still, that anyways, yeah. so let's just keep going. Uh, but since he likes tactile bass so much, he's also wondering if he should be looking for deeper extension, looking at his room EQ uh, wizard measurements. He's hitting 20 hertz with his PB12 NSD. So let me just go back up here. Yeah, you're hitting below that. but Yes, you go. are. I mean, you're, you're quite strong down to it. looks like at least 19, 18. 19, 18, yeah. 
You're yeah, very, very that. strong and linear down to there. And there's still response, audible response, because we're above 85 decibels here. Still response going down to what, 16 hertz? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's hitting 20 hertz, yes. But what about below 20 hertz? Is he missing out? The answer is no, you're not. First of all, you've got something there. And second of all, there's exceedingly little information down that low. I know people are like, I've got the oh, stupid fan thing that's that'll play three hertz or whatever i'm like it's literally a fan it just <laughs> now goes this, around three this times is actually second. gonna come up and i think the next or the question after because we've, we've got a little uh, row of sort of subwoofer and uh, infrasonic and tactile related questions here and so i want to address it i might as well address it now in this first one since he's specifically worried about tactile sensation mm. with the bass the number one tactile sensation that most people want is the kick drum Right? right, they want the kick drum. They want the gunshot, the thing Which that is hits not you. Not nearly as low as they think it is. <laughs> it absolutely is not. That is between forty and sixty hertz. All of that. Let, let's let's be generous and go as low as thirty-five. Right, but it's between thirty-five and let's say sixty-five hertz. That's the range where all of that kick drum, uh, you know, gunshot, that really concussive, hits you in the chest base. That's where all of that is. The below 20 hertz stuff, to be completely honest, if you if you really want to wrap your mind around this, what you are experiencing from a 12, 14, 16 hertz fundamental, what you are primarily experiencing is the harmonic, which is mm -hmm. double that frequency. It's the 24, the 30, the 36 hertz type of sound, 32 hertz type of sound. That's what you're primarily experiencing both in terms of you can't hear it if it's below 20 hertz. Your ears are not giving you any response down there. And when they say, oh, I can feel it. I can feel the tingles. I can feel the rumbles. You're mostly feeling the harmonic. <laughs> That's what's going on there. Now, if that fundamental didn't exist, if it's not playing whatsoever, then okay, some of that harmonic is going to be missing too. You have to have the fundamental for the harmonic to exist. But in terms of, like, if it if you were actually feeling 10 hertz, genuinely feeling 10 hertz, you would be able to count the beats. 10 hertz right. is 10 beats per second. You would be able to count it. And guess, pe people can't. <laughs> when you play a 10 hertz fundamental, people can't count the beats. And if that's what they were actually experiencing, you would be able to, and you can't. And that tells us what you're experiencing is the harmonic. You're actually in a 10 hertz sine wave, if that's what you're playing loud enough that you're actually perceiving it. If you're barely perceiving it, it's the 20 hertz fundamental. If you're feeling it, it's the 40 hertz harmonic. That's actually making you feel it, not the 10 hertz. You're not able to count it. It's the 40 hertz that you feel. So this worry about infrasonics, I'll grant you, if you want to perceive everything that a recording might have, the fundamental needs to exist because otherwise the harmonics won't. But that is not genuinely what you're feeling. So the end result is... You already have tactile transducers. You really don't need to worry about anything beyond that. But worrying so much about below 20 hertz output, and this is going to go for the subsequent questions that are coming up about this. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm not worried about it. I want to hear everything I can hear from my subwoofers. And that means I care about getting down to 20 hertz. I care about right. that more than a lot of people do. But below 20 hertz, I'm not worried. I'm just not worried about it, and you shouldn't be worried about it either. He says the PP2000 Pros aren't spec to play much lower than this PP12 NSD, and we seem to say that for his room size, uh, and we seem to say that for his room size, and now that it's fully enclosed, he doesn't need more output. I mm. would agree with that. Yeah. But the mono price model of 15 is available for less than the PP3000. That might be true. Yes. <laughs> it's also less than whatever and it says it can play all the way down to 14 hertz at minus 3 db <laughs> he knows it's big but he made a cardboard box model and the pair a pair will fit so how different would they sound dual svs pb2000 pros versus dual monolith 15s will he notice the extra extension below 20 hertz no no will he will it give him more of the tactile experience he loves no. no, 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 not really. Or should he, or should he save some money and hop on the PB two thousand Pros right now? He did consider the SVS app to be a bit of a bonus, but he plans to use a mini DSP, so that makes the app kind of moot. I don't think you should do any of the things you're planning. Okay, I think you should buy a single subwoofer PB two thousand uh -huh. and match it with your NSD. Yes, your twelve NSD. That's you've already got one. I agree. That is perfectly. 
reasonable for your room yes. buy another one that's also perfectly reasonable for your room and put it across the room from the one that you currently have and you're done check that's the outlet all you store. need to do check the outlet store because yes. i think very often they'll have a pb2000 not a pro a pb2000 uh quite often they'll have one available in the svs outlet store and what's great about buying from the outlet store is you still get the free shipping you still get the full warranty as though you right. had bought it new so it's a good deal to do that and yeah there's no reason to replace the PB12 NSD that you already have. You have sufficient output. You're getting 16 hertz extension already from that thing. I am just not worried about it. There's no reason that they have to be literally identical right. as long as they're both capable for your room. So yeah, my number one recommendation to you is check the outlet and get a PB2000. If they don't have any PB2000s, a single PB2000 Pro mated to your existing PB12 NSD. Mwah, chef's kiss. Yeah, I don't think you need anything else other than that. I know that's not what you want to hear. You wanted the three thousand, whatever. <laughs> and I honestly think that the 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 to me tactile transducers, and you know that I hate them, and mm. I do. I do not like them. I don't like anything about them. Uh, the other day we were in here watching a movie for the first time in quite a while, and I turned the volume up to a, a more reasonable movie watching level, and mm -hmm. that couch started to shake, and it felt so natural mm, it yeah. felt so right right and the tactile transducers are to give you that experience when the bass is not loud enough to actually yeah. do it itself that's what it's for which is a pretty reasonable thing to be honest because not everybody yeah. can literally play their bass loud enough in certain but situations got, for that to be okay right and, and if you are in a situation where you cannot play your bass loud enough to mm. actually shake your couch first of all why are you worried about tactile bass because mm -hmm. you know no, you, you can still you, want it <laughs> you're not you getting it you're not you going to get it from well I mean, you could buy a thousand uh pb 3000s and stack them up to the <laughs> ceiling and you're still not going to get tactile base because you're not oh, yeah, from the enough. subs themselves yeah yes so if you're never going to get it from the subs themselves mm -hmm. and the, don't worry about the tactile base just worry about the evenness of the base now the joy of the evenness of the base mm -hmm. and this is the thing that most people don't quite get is that it isn't that you are uh that you're going to get more bass it is that the bass will be more even so mm -hmm. you'll be able to raise the volume level kind mm -hmm. of you know without having these massive peaks that make it seem too loud well it yeah actually like, is going to sound quieter overall until it's not and then it's really not going to be quiet so those are the that, that's kind of how at least to me when you add that second subwoofer that's what you get you get the ability since it's, since it's no longer got the peaks in it mm -hmm. You know, and then you're like, you're watching some random show and all of a sudden there's bass come, you know, it's just yeah, like boom the and that bass his everywhere. Right, that his right seat has. Anybody sitting in their right seat is going to be going at the, at right now. What he has right now is going to be like, this is bass might be too loud, turn everything down overall. Right. And then the person who's sitting in his left seat, there's some certain sounds there that are like full on nulls. They're not having They're a just, great experience. They don't, they don't hear anything you know? at all. So yeah. I'm. Uh, like I'm looking at the pictures that he showed of his room. I I'm thinking the middle of his left wall is an ideal candidate to put sure. the second subwoofer, which will be you know straight across from the sub that he's already got in the middle of his right wall. And I would expect that will help even that out. You might be able to like he's gonna he says he wants to use a mini DSP for it. You can create your own house curve that has a nice gradual rise in the base. And now that all three seats aren't experiencing different things, you can make all of it a bit louder if you want to. But all of that can be done with your current sub plus a PC two thousand. <laughs> And there's not really any reason to buy more than that. Yeah, I agree. All right, Mike. Mike also has a subwoofer question. His room is small, roughly 12 by 12 by 7 and a half. So it's very small. Uh, or about 1,100 cubic feet. He asked for subwoofer recommendations before knowing that he wants strong 20 hertz output. But he can't really fit any of the big ported models. We told him to go with SVS SB2000 Pro. That sounds like a very good idea. And he's still <laughs> strongly considering that, especially with the prices about to go up. Is everything uh -huh. going to be with the prices about to go up? But just buy it. Stop complaining. <laughs> All right. But he still calls himself an AV noob. But now he's got in his head that he really wants to experience 10 hertz bass. He's been reading some. I can slap take. you ten times in the second, and then you can experience it. That's ex that <laughs> is about <laughs> done. You've experienced ten hertz space. Now stop it and go buy a SB one thousand. I mean two thousand. Uh, can can any somewhat reason reasonably affordable sealed sub will for deliver that in a small room like his can a sealed sub deliver infrasonic bass he did come across the stark sound sw12 it's a hundred dollars less than the sb2000 pro 
and they'll be two hundred dollars less after October fourth. Mm-hmm. And they claim it plays down to sixteen hertz at minus three dB. Notice that doesn't say ten, which is what you were <laughs> looking for, but whatever. That's lower than nineteen hertz claimed by SB two thousand Pro. <laughs> Should you go for that instead? Let, let me look at the stupid subwoofer that I'm probably going to say don't buy. I already don't. I already well, don't al- like it. It's also three decibels less than what? <laughs> because- I know, right? <laughs> Because if, if the other one is louder across the board and then it's minus three at 19, if everything is quieter across the board until it gets down to 16, then that, that where it actually matters in the 40 to 60 hertz range is, uh, yeah, not necessarily going to be equal. I mean, the uh, I don't think the Stark sound is, is any type of bad looking subwoofer whatsoever. Mm, uh, it, but, the specs look okay, but the amplifier is a little sus, but other yeah, than that, it's fine. It looks perfectly decent, but they're... But, like on paper, just objectively, it is not as capable as an SB2000 Pro. So I suspect what's happening is actually playing quieter across the board. Right. And then they can say, okay, now we can claim that the minus three decibel point is a bit lower because you know, in reference to what? Um, so please refer back to the question above us if you've skipped directly here in the timestamps. Please refer to the question just before yours uh, because we go through why 10 hertz bass is just not something that you really genuinely need to worry about. You need to worry about 20 hertz. I'm all for that. You need to worry a lot about 40 hertz. But actually worrying about playing 10 hertz at 115 decibels, which is not going to happen with any reasonably price sealed subwoofer in any size of room, um, is just not what is actually Actually contributing to your perception of any of yeah. that sound. It's all the harmonics. It's 20 hertz and the 40 hertz harmonics. Why 10 hertz, receiving. though, is the real question. That it, That's like such a random number to want to, to hit. I mean, is it... Somebody uh, said it on a forum, I'm sure, or in a video. There's all the YouTube guys, and they talk about it. And I mean, again, the thing that's often happening is they get their first sub that objectively... Yeah, there are subs objectively. You put them in a room, and they can play 115 decibels at 10 hertz. And they go, oh, I've never experienced anything like that. Yeah, you've never experienced 20 hertz harmonics that are that loud. Yeah. That's what you haven't experienced before. It's not the the ten hertz. It's, or like I say, you'd be able to count it if you were actually perceiving ten hertz, ten beats a second. Think about that. It's not that fast. Yeah. I mean, you so, could just look at the amplifier difference between the Stark sound and the SVS yeah, yeah, just yeah. alone and see that you know they're just they just don't have the power reserves in order to hit the you know the, the volume that that. Uh, yeah you know that the uh svs can do so yeah, in the, your the room are you going to really notice half. yeah are you really going to be able to notice the the difference uh between these two subs i don't know i don't know i, I couldn't tell you that for sure for sure because your room is very small so maybe you don't yeah. need and that the thing much is, output in an enclosed room like this you do get a whole lot of room gain a whole lot of room gain and that sp2000 pro is only rolling off at a very gradual 12 decibels per octave so we're saying, you know, it's minus three decibels at 19 hertz. So down at nine and a half hertz, it's only 12 decibels quieter. <laughs> so at, in all honesty, if you do, if you were to experience anything in a room as small as yours, you know, for, just from the room gain, uh, you're going to get about six to nine decibels of room gain, depending on exactly where it's positioned. Yeah, where so, it's positioned. Yeah. You know, nine and a half hertz isn't going to be equal to 19 hertz with the SP2000 Pro, but it's, it's still going to be quite a bit. So my advice stays, uh, I do think, if you're, if you're strongly considering the SP2000 Pro, go ahead and get it before the price goes up by 100 bucks. because why the heck not? And uh, my advice hasn't changed to you whatsoever, Mike. I'm sticking to my guns. Yeah, I don't see any reason to... I mean, I just I just don't see any reason to to, to invest in this, this other sub over the SVS. I don't think the price difference is great enough for me to say... He was purely that's... looking at the spec that said 16 instead of 19. <laughs> yeah, if I look at the rest of the specs, it it doesn't look to me. It, I can see where your hundred dollars went. You know? Okay, and the SVS, you know what I mean. The right. SVS, I would feel more comfortable. And then not only that, hopefully at some point in your life you will not be in a twelve by twelve by seven and a half foot room, mm. and you will have two S, you know, SB two thousand pros that maybe can go into you know the next room that you maybe not. But these this other sub I think is going to. Once you take it out of this room, you're you're gonna just not have much to do with it. <laughs> Tom, 
Tom's room was tiny, enclosed, and quite heavily treated. He was running a 5.1 setup in there using a Sen Sierra 2 EX speakers up front with CBM 170 surrounds and the PC uh, SVS PC 13 ultra cylinder sub, all powered by a NAD uh, T. 758v3 receiver since he had a couple of pairs of bose cube speakers lying around he decided to give atmos a try so he's got 5.1.4 he was pleasantly surprised at how much he liked it i think bose is a perfect <laughs> i think this is a great use of a bose speaker <laughs> sure. because it's probably yeah. it's, it, i think atmos frequencies are smack dab in the sweet spot of what bose can actually you've play. got 200 to 2000 hertz not much above or below off you go <laughs> Atmos. Off you go. You're good to go. <laughs> so the additional overhead speakers seem to improve panning sound effects, uh, discrete directional sound effects, and the overall sense of ambiance. So he's going to make it a permanent upgrade. Uh, I'm already going to tell you right now. I don't know where this question's going, but if you're at <laughs> questions, if you're going to ask me whether or not you should get different overhead speakers, the answer is no. You should. That stick is with coming what up. Got. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you right now. That's where I'm going to. That's where I'm going to land on this thing. Unless you have a real good reason why you don't want those things over your head, that's in him. That uh, I'm going to. I'm going to say stick with the Bose. So his NAD receiver has seven amps built in. So he had to borrow a receiver from another room to try out the full nine speaker configuration. What's a good small inexpensive two channel amp and only needs to power the rear heights well the fossey one we keep yeah. talking about but uh i would i would love to be able to re recommend the dayton audio one that i've got but i don't really sell it anymore so yeah or the <laughs> parts what is it is it dayton is that what i have uh yeah you have a dayton audio uh well you've got the apa 100 and that doesn't 100, exist right, anymore right. that doesn't yeah, exist that's anymore. not around right. anymore oh yeah right. the, the the fossey audio the uh tda 7498e which even i have to look at that because i never remember that one it just um doesn't really tell the story of what it is with any of those numbers. Uh, but yeah, that's a Class D amplifier, but for your rear heights, completely fine. And <laughs> we've had multiple More people tell us how pleasantly say they surprised they are by this little thing. It does not get hot. It sips power. It's like 160 watts per channel if you want to, because Class D and efficient. Uh, and yeah, very easy. So yeah, it was $67. I don't think you're going to beat that. And I mean, the, the size, you can hide it behind something. It's tiny. Takes up no space, sips power. Very easy to use. Uh, if you just want some alternatives that are more like standard width, you know, the 17 inch width, if that's just what you want, uh, there is the Audio Source Amp 100 VS. You know, that exists out there. Now, that's one of the last remaining Class AB ones that is this, you know, smaller form factor, particularly from front to back. You know, about what is it, 80 watts per channel, I think, something like that, and that Amp 100 VS, uh, but about $155 for that one. So, you know, it's over twice the price of the little Fosse audio. Uh, Dayton does have their APA 102, which actually has Bluetooth built into it now, so it's a BT on the end of the model name. Uh, but they have that one, but that's Class D, and I think it's 60 watts per channel, something like that. And that's about yeah, 150 bucks. Yeah. That's about 150 bucks. Uh, uh, Outdoor Speaker Depot has a I think the same <laughs> amplifier. They call theirs the XMP100. Uh, but again, it's about $145, something like that. So they're all right in that ballpark range of about 150 bucks. But um, yeah, if that, that's just if you want something that's 17 inches wide. Otherwise, that Fosse audio all day long. It's the least expensive, totally capable. Yeah. And here comes the question I already answered. That's right. So we can just skip it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like so to give the some Bose Cube speakers things. were fine for just trying things out, but for a permanent installation, he'd like better overhead speakers. You totally <laughs> do not <laughs> need them. I mean, the thing is, he's already saying what I've experienced with my Bose Cubes was enough to convince me that I want to keep Atmos. Um, and then he's thinking, okay, it'll get even better with better speakers. And we're like, it was already good enough to convince you. So that's the argument for Tom's approach of just even well <laughs> enough mean, alone. As much as I love to spend money, and I do, I just <laughs> think that uh, I just think that there's – I've never – in. Like people are like, should I buy Bose speakers or what should I do with my Bose speakers? And I'm most people are like, throw them away. Yeah, you know, they're, they're garbage. Throw them away. They're, they don't play. Any, they don't play the whole frequency response. Blah blah. Now I can say with all confidence, Atmos is a great use <laughs> sure. for You'll these speakers. Feel cube like you're speakers. making use of them. They, I mean, and they're at this point they're free. Right? You're not spending any more money. So why right. would you? So he says he's not going for insulin speakers. So we're just going to good small speakers that will be easy to mount overhead. I do have an article at AV Gadgets that talk okay. that goes through some of the uh, Atmos speakers that I recommend based mm -hmm. on, you know, what you can buy, you know, SVS prime elevations. You know, they, they can mm -hmm. be ceiling mounted. Um, 
uh, I would of course go to accessories for less immediately if I was doing this and just look to see what they have as far as I did look today and there's really stuff. not much options anymore. They don't and have the Focals anymore. They don't have the Bostons anymore. So, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, the tough. way that the way that this podcast works, you may be listening to this in the future. So always go to accessories for less first and sure. look there first to see what they have because it can change from hour to hour or day to day. Mm -hmm. So I would look there. So you could look at my article, best at most speakers for your home theater. I'll link it. Uh, uh, Rob will link it up in the show, show yep. notes, and then he's going to have some other uh, other options for you that all cost more than zero dollars, <laughs> which is what you should spend on this because the Bose speakers are perfect, and I think it's a fantastic use for them. And you should not spend any more money on this. Just to point out, out of the article that Tom mentioned at AV Gadgets, I'd probably point you to the Elac. The debut 2.0. There's both an Elac debut 2.0 on wall and an Atmos module, and those are going for about three hundred dollars a pair. That's sort of the rough price range you're looking in there. So, out of those are the ones I would point at. Um, now, one of my favorites these days to recommend when it comes to very versatile, uh, like on wall or on ceiling type of Atmos speakers is uh, Aperion Audios. Their uh, Novus A5 because that's one of these wedge shaped speakers that has different mounting positions, like all. All over the place. There's a gazillion ways to mount that uh, Aperion Audio um, Novus A5, but those are $550 a pair. Those aren't cheap speakers. Those are more expensive than your surround speakers. Not as expensive as your front speakers, but you know they're not cheap. But the sound quality is nice and neutral, very easy to mount in whatever way that you want, including you can use them as up-firing ones on top of your speakers if you want to. So I do right. like how versatile they are. Tom already mentioned the SVS Prime Elevation speakers. Uh, those will be $500 a pair after October 4th, um, or $600 a pair if you're going for the gloss finish. So uh, again, more expensive than the Elax, but those are the wedge shape very easy to mount wherever you might want to mount them uh yeah just uh, they you can request the uh ceiling bracket fill in thing if you're actually going to mount them on the ceiling so yeah which is what i've done mind. i've mm -hmm. got i've got them on the wall and on the ceiling so i've done both yeah. mounting options and they're the ceiling mounting is a little bit more of a pain in the butt but the, right. it's not that bad no no not at all uh ascend acoustics of course themselves have their htm 200 se that i love to recommend uh those are 360 dollars a pair now that's just a standard sealed bookshelf speaker so on the back it's got a couple of mounting points but it doesn't have any integrated mounting you'd have to buy your own type of mount be that wall or ceiling so just keep that in mind that mounting them you'd have to have your own uh mount of some sort and and depending on where you want to attach it but it's got and the screw holes some, right there some place in the show notes there's that link for the the av gadgets mounting options the mounting oh, okay. stuff that we talked about earlier with uh daz's question right 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 and um so lastly if you're just looking for the cheapest price and you didn't have any speakers already on hand, now I'm not necessarily going to say this is going to be that much of an upgrade over the Bose Cubes, but just because somebody else might be listening to it and going, what's the cheapest way I can get for easy to mount overhead Atmos speakers? Mono price, uh, this is actually a 5.1 speaker package. All right, it's the uh, the HT35, so it's got a little subwoofer and a little center speaker that comes with it, but comes with the four satellite speakers, uh, have an integrated screw hole mount on the back. You will want to use Mono Price's own mounts because even though they say it's a one quarter inch uh, by 20 thread, it doesn't actually work with that. They've gone with, I think, Whichever one is metric versus imperial, they went with the other ones. So their own mounts work with it. But like uh, some of the other mounts out there that say they're the same specifications, they don't actually fit nicely into those screw holes. Mm. Uh, but 180 bucks for the entire 5.1 package. So you can think of like basically, what, $45 each? <laughs> for the four speakers so pretty darn inexpensive and and that could be an option uh but in general i tend to agree with tom in this particular instance you probably don't need to buy any of them and you can stick with your bose cubes and it's a great use of them so tom not me this other, this guy who's asking questions has yeah. been using his xbox one s as his source device for streaming services now that he wants more atmos content is the apple tv 4k still the go-to uh, i mean everything that comes out of my xbox is atmos <laughs> it says so how can you argue with That's, that i can't um, argue it's a front of the receiver says it's that was actually switched it back to uh uh dts x and mm -hmm. let it do its thing what i found out uh, for those of you that are switching on the fly back and forth what you'll mm -hmm. notice is that when you switch to atmos it immediately goes into atmos mm -hmm. it, it, and uh it, it, it says allow bit stream but then give it you know if, if it's atmos then 
uh, or if it's if it's going to be up converted, and it just always says Atmos at that point. Okay. Like it never says anything about Atmos. Okay. But if you switch it to DTSX, it'll switch to it'll tell you it's doing some up up converting on the uh, okay. Or, or, you know, whatever. It's doing something on the receiver. The receiver will say DTS, you know, or Dolby Digital and the DTSX up, up conversion is what it will oh, say okay. on the receiver. Hmm. But when you first switch it, like if you switch back and forth, it'll always go straight to Atmos and it'll stay in Atmos and it sounds fine. But when you first switch it, you're going to notice that when you go to the DTS uh, bit streaming or whatever the default thingy is, uh, you will find you'll get audio dropouts for a bit. Oh, okay. And what I've determined is that it needs to relock on to mm -hmm. the audio signal, which means you have to either switch and switch the app, or it has to go from one episode <laughs> to a different episode. Right. So once it switches in and out, then it'll lock on to whatever it's supposed to be, and you okay. won't have those audio dropouts anymore. But if you're thinking, you know, you're switching back and forth, and the DTS one is all messed up, because what I thought, I thought mm. the DTS wasn't working right, because I was getting these weird sort of, it wasn't quite a pop, but it was almost like a pop and it was like a pause for a second hmm. and it was it, and that's what it was so once it locked on it was fine but uh <laughs> just so you know if you're going to switch back and forth to kind of test it the dts mm. one doesn't isn't quite as uh it takes a little, little while to lock on all right well the audio <sighs> weirdness aside uh because i mean the apple tv 4k does a very nice job of just uh well technically the apple tv 4k is decoding everything internally so you'll most often see multi-channel on the front of your AV receiver because it is taking Dolby Digital Plus if it's 5.1 or 7.1 and decoding that into multi-channel PCM. If it's Atmos, it's actually the PCM Plus Atmos metadata, the Dolby Mat format that's coming out of there. But it handles it all seamlessly and it handles it all well. Uh, the main reason why, yes, I do think the Apple TV 4K is, in the grand scheme of things, still the best choice as a streaming device is because... It does the best job of frame rate switching. Uh, all the other ones, the Roku's now, they've got some ability. The uh, Amazon Fire TV 4K devices, which are probably going to be my second pick. If you just want something that's less expensive, I would probably point you to an Amazon Fire TV 4K device these days. Um, they do have settings in there that talk about frame rate switching, but it's very hit and miss from app to app. Whereas I think it's only Peacock that doesn't work properly on the Apple TV 4K because they refuse to use Apple's own video player and had to roll their own and that made peacock the frame rate sucks. switching if, if you're paying for work. peacock you're throwing your movie away, you're <laughs> throwing your money away as far as i'm concerned that is the work i could not have enjoyed my experience with peacock any less if it just if it had just not worked it would have at least not worked mm -hmm. this just right. worked so poorly in so many different ways i just hate it i never was able to confirm my account and therefore, okay. I was never able to, to get like full access to every. I was supposed to have full access to all the, the right, Olympic right, right. stuff. And I was never yeah. able to do that because the email would never come through. And <laughs> and whatever the, uh, the um, what do they call it? The customer support just stopped talking to me. So I never right. was able to get all the stuff I was supposed to get. And plus, you couldn't even like, you know, scan forward. You had to like press okay. fast forward and then press play and then press fast forward i mean what a, and it wouldn't even like show you what you were fast forwarding through i'm like i could mm. do that on a vcr like 25 <laughs> years ago and you guys can't figure it. it's a worst peacock so sucks. people will argue with me sometimes about oh this device is just as capable at a lower price i'm like yeah technically so but in a practical sense in in practice what actually happens going from app to app the apple tv 4k remains the most consistent at giving you the best possible streaming experience in terms of it matches the frame rate, it matches the HDR, whatever that might be, if it's HDR10, if it's HLG, if it's Dolby Vision, if it's standard dynamic range, it doesn't just keep you in HDR, which is the default of a lot of the other devices, and giving you the highest quality audio that you can get. Uh, it is the most consistent across the greatest number of apps, and for that reason, I still choose it as my top choice. All right. Carlos. Carlos has a Denon X4300H, and he typically uses it with uh, Odyssey engaged in the flat setting. His room is acoustically treated, and his typical master volume level is minus 25 to minus 15, depending on the content. But he says he does not use dynamic EQ. For the most part, he thinks it sounds really good, but when he's playing vinyl, some records have really obnoxious high frequencies, <laughs> so he sometimes finds himself switching between Odyssey on in the flat setting or Odyssey off. 
The thing is, if he turns Odyssey off at his typical listening levels, it usually doesn't sound as good, but if he cranks the volume to minus three, which is really loud, he's blown away with how good the music sounds without uh, uh, XT32 engaged. The highs sound pleasing and the bass sounds thick without being overbearing. So in this case, uh, so is it the case that louder you play, the less EQ you need? Well, the reason is, is because you're not using dynamic EQ. <laughs> Honest with that you. is part of it. That is the um, whole, like at minus twenty five. There's a whole bunch of bass that is there in the signal, but without dynamic EQ turned on, you're just not hearing it. So, uh, so again, that's part uh, of it. curves of equal loudness. I, I'm I've got an article that I'm on the back burner that I'm going to write about this on AV gadgets. So I haven't done it yet, but it will be coming out eventually. And curves of equal loudness. We've talked about the Fletcher Munson curves quite a bit. And basically, what this is is as as you turn the volume down. Uh, if you keep all the frequencies even, you hear the you perceive the bass less than you perceive the higher frequencies. So as you as the volume gets lower, you have a harder time hearing bass than you do having uh, hearing mm -hmm. the the treble. So which means that as you would turn it down to minus twenty five, minus fifteen, minus thirty five, mm -hmm. wherever you are, suddenly you're not perceiving any of the bass which is what the, right. the 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 curves of equal loudness do is they boost that bass up not to make mm -hmm. it extra loud but to make it perceptionally as loud as the treble now you have turned at, it at down least audible <laughs> at least audible, up right. to the le the threshold of audibility at least that yeah so by turning that, by not engaging dynamic EQ, whatever mm -hmm. form you have on whatever, you're, we're talking about Denon for you, but in general, whatever receiver you've got and whatever. Y pow volume or. Whatever they're calling yep. it. Yeah. Uh, by not engaging those curves of equal loudness and then saying, well, when I, you know, turn Odyssey completely off and I uh, boost up the volume up to minus three, mm -hmm. well, you're almost at reference level, right? So therefore, and the bass in fact, and for the music you might be well above THX reference level. Right. As we talked about last week, a lot of music is mastered fifteen decibels louder than THX reference levels. That so I would say if you are not going, if you're going to compare this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, first of all, by engaging Odyssey and, and not engaging Odyssey, I think perceptually you're going to have a different volume level at minus mm -hmm. three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you're not going to have the same volume level. So you would have to somehow be able to level match and then change the volume between the two. So whatever is louder is going to be perceived by you <laughs> as being better on some mm -hmm. level. Uh, but I think if you got, if you had just Odyssey, now you don't need the dynamic EQ on at minus three. Right. It, at that point, you don't barely need it. doing anything. It, it, it might be if it, doing I'd be surprised if it amount. did anything yeah, at yeah, minus yeah. three. Yeah. Okay, so you can just turn Odyssey on and off at that point, and you should there should be a difference, and it should be a positive difference in the in the case of Odyssey because your whatever inaccuracies are going on in your frequency response because of your room should be corrected. Now, we don't know anything about your room based on what this this question yeah. here. Other than so it could be that Odyssey. Treated literally isn't doing that much for you mm -hmm. because your room's so bad. So, <laughs> and, and that's not. often the case. People are, I mean, that's often the case. People come to us and they're like, I've, you know, I bought the speakers you said, I put the speakers where you told me to put them, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, I turn Odyssey on, it does nothing. Mm. Okay, what is, your, what is your room? It's marble. What do you mean it's marble? It is marble. And we've had people like this. We've had a marble floor, marble mm -hmm. walls, marble everything. And they're like, you know, Odyssey doesn't do much for me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't, what would you expect it to do in a highly reflective room like that? So we don't know exactly what Odyssey is or isn't doing. And neither, and I mean, unless you've, you've treated your room to begin with, Odyssey might not be doing that much. But uh, in your case, you know, by turning that volume level up and then trying to compare it to something you're experiencing with Odyssey on at a lower volume level, mm. I mean, that's not even an apples to oranges comparison. That's like an apples to, you know, cat. Right. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's a complete it's a completely different. You've, so many things are affecting how you're perceiving this. Um, there is you you are you really need to compare something that is similar the two the two things similarly uh, to even get close and. I would say that just going up to minus three and putting Odyssey on and off 
probably is still too different unless like i suspect uh your room isn't already treated and taken care of and well, uh, he said and his room is treated but we don't we don't know exactly how good the end result is uh, I don't but know what that to, to answer yeah. the question directly is it the case that the louder you play it the less eq you need uh the answer is no um, right you know if you have if you have humps and dips, those humps and dips go up and down linearly as you increase yes. or decrease the volume. So it's not the case that the louder you play it, the less you need EQ. Uh, but I think somewhere the less along you need the dynamic line, dynamic EQ. <laughs> yeah, somewhere along the line, Carlos seems to have either just by pure thought and and not quite fully understanding exactly what Odyssey doing at different volume levels or it's easy enough to find misinformation and people with bad takes about Odyssey if you've been reading about it um you know spe he specifically mentioned I do not use dynamic EQ I'm like why not why the heck not especially when your typical volume level is below zero on the volume dial it's minus 15 to minus 25 you should be using dynamic eq exactly as tom explained it is to keep everything audible and perceptually closer to linear so you definitely should turn that on but also he insisted that if he uses odyssey he only ever uses flat he only ever uses the right. flat setting and then goes on to say i'm listening to certain things particularly on vinyl records and i find the high frequencies a bit obnoxious and i'm like well, what about the Odyssey target curve, the one that rolls off the highs a little bit, the one that was designed based on listener feedback to what they found more pleasing versus what might be objectively ruler flat. And mm -hmm. th this, uh, the thing is the X4300H, that was the first model year that it does work with the Odyssey editor app. And he mentioned nothing about the Odyssey editor app. Uh, and, and that might be the solution that you're looking for here, Carlos. Um, you know, but I mean, number one, turn dynamic EQ on. I think that's going to solve a lot of things, including once you have all the bass back to at least being audible, you might not notice the high frequencies being so quote unquote obnoxious anymore because there's a lot of a masking effect that goes on once you have all the bass back to being audible and, you know, right. which was completely not being heard before when you had it at minus 15 or minus 25. So that's that's number one. The second one is even if you don't use the Odyssey editor app, just try the Odyssey target curve instead of flat because it's right there. You don't have to destroy or redo anything. You can just toggle that switch in the settings. Super easy. And if what you're finding is particular recordings, these high frequencies are just shrill or harsh or whatever, that's exactly what the Odyssey target curve is for. So those two things and then the question as wrote, EQ still needs to be applied regardless of the, uh, the volume that you're playing it back. That's right. Dave, uh, do we have time? I don't know where we, we should. are. We should. We've got at least 10 yeah, minutes if we're going minutes. to two okay. hours. Dave, last week Dave asked about trying to set reference volume on his Anki receiver that only displays absolute volume, all positive numbers from 0 to 99, and doesn't list what reference volume is supposed to be anywhere in the manual. He has run the AccuEQ in the past, but like us, he came to the conclusion that it was better left turned off. Yeah. Yeah. However, he recalls that it set all of his speaker trim levels either 0 or plus 1. When he manually did things with his SBL meter, he had to turn the master volume up to 88 in order to read 75 dB. That was with his speaker trim levels manually set to minus 2, minus 3, or minus 4. So maybe 85 is reference volume in this particular case? Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? It and absolutely it... would. It is totally reasonable that that might yeah. be what it is. <laughs> and should he still set all his trim levels to something like plus five, like we suggested last week? He's a bit worried they might lead to distortion or clipping. I won't lead to distortion or clipping. I would have just run Accu EQ and let it do its thing, and then another turn time off... I left those trim levels. Yeah, yeah. I left those trim levels. What they are. The reason um, I said that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if when you run AccuEQ, because I didn't know last week that he had already run it in the past right, and right. seen what the values were. The reason I said it might set them to something like plus five is because I was assuming that when he said he used his SPL meter and turned the master volume up until it read 75 dB, that that was with the trim levels all set to zero. It right. wasn't. He had manually set them to like minus three on average. So that tells me that, yeah, right around 85 is probably the true reference volume on this particular AV receiver. If you manually set your trim levels back to zero or plus one like Accu initially did, then you'll probably find that 85 is exactly where your SPL reader, uh, meter reads 75 dB. And that would be a completely reasonable uh, value for them to have set as reference volume would be 85. So yeah, that's that's that. Right. So putting all the specifics aside, he, he if he just wants some higher efficiency speakers, more efficient than, than his Polk RTI setup, what do we recommend? I recommend that you never, ever, 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 ever shop for speakers based on one parameter. 
Okay. That's, I mean, the only parameter that you should care about when shopping for speakers is how do these sound? <laughs> yes. Although, I mean, sensitivity is one that I can look at because particularly if you're in a big room from far away, yes. it is reasonable to, like, you're not going to want ones that are 82 dB at one watt. That's going to be a problem. So that that's a reasonable I... spec to consider. Would agree with that, but you know I, that's not the only thing. So oh, definitely not uh, the only thing, though. Sure. So I mean, Klipsch is anything with a horn sure. is going to be your friend. You can, I mean, if you really want to be crazy about it, you can go for those compression tweeter models that we've talked with JTR or JTR would be a, a top candidate. Although they're, they're not cheap, but they're if you're talking cheap. very efficient, we're talking a yeah. hundred dB plus efficiency from one watt from one yeah. meter away. Uh, yeah, they are big. They, they are boxy. They are ugly, uh, but they are they go very behind efficient. screens. <laughs> they go behind screens. And so. I don't think that's really what you need in your room size from your listening distance, but they absolutely do exist. There's no denying that. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of ones that I like and I think are more appropriate for the sort of price range that he was talking about and the room size he was talking about, HSU. HSU has a whole lineup of speakers now, starting with what I think is going to be a really good choice, which would actually be their HC1, which once you include the shipping is about $300 each. Now, of course, that HC1 is uh, sort of uh, described as a center speaker, but right in the manual for that speaker, they tell you how to unscrew the horn on there, rotate it 90 degrees, and stand the speaker up vertically. So it mm. absolutely can be used as a vertical left and right speaker. Uh, there is, of course, the bookshelf version of it, the HB1. These are all the Mark II versions. And they'll go, those go for about $200 each after shipping is included. Uh, however, if you want even a bit larger, even a bit more efficient, even a bit po higher power handling, and therefore can play even less, louder than those HC and HB speakers. Uh, HSU has their CCB8 speaker. This is a concentric design. This is the tweeter down into the throat of the 8-inch woofer that's in there. Now, those go for $780 a pair uh, with shipping included. So that's, you know, what, a $390 each. So they are a bit more expensive. They're big. That's an 8-inch woofer in there. And so these are like almost a foot across. Okay, don't be fooled by the, the svelte-looking picture. Uh, that's a big yeah. speaker. But yeah, I, I like the way the HSU sound. I think they're priced extremely reasonably for the performance level that they provide. Uh, and I, I find them to be more linear than Klipsch. So when we're talking high-efficiency speakers at a reasonable price, HSU is my go-to. Tom is frowning at something. Yeah, it's, it's an eight-inch woofer. That's what's that's what's just that's what throws you off about this. It's an eight-inch right. woofer, and then you don't realize it looks like because of the size of the box that it's in, it looks that's like right. it's like a four four and a half or six and a half inch woofer. <laughs> no, that's a, big, that's a big boy speaker. That's, that's not a, a small big speaker, old speaker at all. And it's got dual rear ports, which it is does. unusual for a bookshelf speaker. So, yeah, uh, I, I could go with any of those. Um, I could go with any of those. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, show me, show me. I think we can All do right. Nick's and that'll be it. Nick. Apparently, independently from when he we mentioned it during our episode number 550, I'm sorry, 752, uh, thanks to Martin telling us about it, Nick came across Sweet Chaos's subwoofer comparison spreadsheet. I have no idea what that is, but whatever. It's a large, oh, here it is. It's, it's a, a large compilation of subwoofer sheet. models that are available to purchase, no DIY models, with the S CEA 2010 a measurements listed but nick is wondering if the spreadsheet is, spreadsheet is completely accurate because he looked at the figures listed for several of the models that database measured and they don't all line up database <laughs> does have both outdoor and indoor measurements but neither set matches up perfectly so it doesn't account for the discrepancies and the spreadsheet has an intro tab that includes a mention of cea 2010 a being different than cta 2010 b <laughs> But that still doesn't seem to consistently explain the differences. Is there a simple reason why the figures in this spreadsheet don't match exactly to what database audioholics Brent Butterworth and others have listed in their respective sites? Because measurements, if you can't control every variable, which you can't if you take it outside, which is what people well, do. I mean, the thing is, this spreadsheet, he is not actually measuring all these numbers right. themselves. He is so he's grabbing them from somebody. Data. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever and he grabbed them from, that's who he that's what he got. That's what he got. And what he has decided to do, because he he is trying to make this as like for like as possible. So that he's not just saying, okay, here are the figures directly from this website, exactly under the parameters that they used, and therefore you would have to carefully keep track of that if you 
you wanted to make a comparison. He's like, I want you to be able to look at this spreadsheet and compare it on the spreadsheet like for like. So he did some translation. So on some of the sites, they are referencing what they're measuring to one meter, the microphone being one meter away from the sub. And on some of the sites, they're referencing it to the microphone being two meters away from the sub. Now, in that case, the two meter measurement will be six decibels quieter than the one meter measurement. So he's referenced everything to two meters. So if the site that originally posted the review and originally posted the CEA 2010A measurements, if they had referenced it to one meter, he's going to decrease their numbers by six decibels so that it is referenced to two meters away. So that's one thing. In the case of database, they already referenced everything to two meters away, but they referenced RMS, root mean square, or a rough average. Uh, that is typically used for the continuous output, is the RMS value. Whereas he has referenced everything to the peak value. Now, CEA 2010A as a specification allows for both of those, all right? And sometimes they list both of them and some places list only one or the other. But they're like, you can have a continuous value, what's the maximum output for continuous versus a peak value, a short burst, what's the maximum output for that? So he has referenced everything in the spreadsheet to the microphone being two meters away to the peak burst maximum output level. And the difference between the average uh, continuous output level versus the peak output level is the peak output level under the specification is three decibels louder than the continuous. So database does the continuous, the RMS from two meters away. That means everything in this chart, if it's from database, the number is going to be three decibels higher because these are all referenced to peak burst instead of continuous. Uh, if it's from Audioholics, Audioholics tends to reference the same thing two meters away, continuous. So the measurements that were taken from Audioholics, the, all the numbers in the uh, chart will appear three decibels louder. But some of the other places, like I say, they do one meter or they already do peak. So that's the translation that's going on there. I can't say it's exactly simple, but it is consistent and it is understandable why the actual figures that are listed there are different versus what's published on the site. None of these, none of them, nothing in this spreadsheet is using the newer CTA 2010B specification because that one isn't just uh, referencing to the uh, microphone distance or whether it's continuous or burst. They get into some like EQ tailoring and curtaining and distortion figures that are all different. So everything here has been done under the CEA 2010A specification. Uh, so you don't have to worry that there was like a CEA 2010 a versus a CTA 2010B uh, translation going on. He hasn't done any of that. He's like, I'm only taking sites that post CEA 2010A uh, measurements. So that much is consistent. Uh, okay. So, I hope so that who we have some left? Sense. We have Carl, which I have already answered him via email, but it's an interesting question that I think people will enjoy. And DJ from Brightside Home Theater, he had, he had a question that I threw in there. And again, a, a good reference for, uh, for everyone else. So we will talk about those next week, but they were not uh, time-sensitive questions. They mm. will last, and so that is good to have for next week. First up. All right. This is AV Rant, the question that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your the question, question answered. that answers. We're the question. We are the podcast. What did I say? All right, whatever. <laughs> Caffeine's really starting to kick in now. Yeah, getting a little right. fuzzy. So this is the eight, this is the podcast that answers your home theater and mm -hmm. AV questions. To get your question answered, all you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our 133 patrons over at patreon.com for be our listeners of the week. This Patreon's a service where you sign up to be a contributing supporter. So uh, every month they take some money from you and give it to us. So we have 133 patrons. So thank you very much, all of you. Yes, indeed. Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, think of it as a voluntary subscription, if you please. 133 patrons over there. And thank you all very much for your financial support. I also want to thank the people who sent us some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going. That includes Jonathan, Tom, Gorinder, Carl, Max, Mike, DJ, Dave, Michael, and Jack. So thank you very much for thanking us. For sure. I'll repeat the names one more time. Jonathan, Tom, Gorinder, Carl, Max, Mike, DJ, Dave, Michael, and Jack. Thank you all so much for those notes of encouragement and gratitude. Really do appreciate them. And a big thank you to everybody who continues to listen. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something.
want your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.